Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Its affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall. Sit down. Anywhere you like. I have a small confession to make. I am crazy about ghosts, and I cannot for the life of me comprehend why anyone should be afraid of them. What, after all, what do ghosts do? They haunt, that's all. To haunt means to visit, to frequent. In short, to hang around. What's so scary about that? A hopeful lover hangs around a lot. If an inspiring lover or a wistful compatriot can hang around without inspiring fear, why not an anxious ghost? Is it... Is it really you, Paul? Huh? Yes, Melba. It is I. <laughs> Don't cry, Melba. I can't... I can't help it. All right, dearest. Go ahead and cry. Oh. Paul. Paul, tell me something. What? Are you happy? Where... Where you are? I'm really sorry you asked me that, Melba. <laughs> mystery drama, Ghost Talk, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Lenka Peterson and Elliot Reed. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. You don't see many people putting salt in their beer nowadays. Not that there's anything wrong with salt on radishes or french fries, but man, not in the king of beers. Truth is, the only thing salt can do for Budweiser is make it salty. An unwise thing to do to the only beer in America that's beechwood aged. Unsalted Budweiser has become the most popular beer in the world. That's because in brewing Bud, the Budweiser brewmaster goes all the way for a taste, a smoothness, a drinkability you'll find in no other beer at any price. And something 
something else you can take without a grain of salt. The fact that when you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Ever been riding along in your car and hear a radio announcement asking you to go to your local hospital to make an emergency blood donation? For donors with B-negative blood. Happens every day. Call that hospital How come blood is in such short supply that emergency pleas have to be made? Because not enough people give blood. It's that simple. We know you're busy these days. But think, you're alive and well, too. And you could help others to be that way. Your easy donation of blood to Red Cross or any other volunteer blood bank actually helps a number of people. Because the blood you give is split up into various components, sometimes as many as five. It gives life to a whole lot of people. So don't wait for an emergency announcement before you call your local Red Cross blood bank. If you call now, there doesn't have to be a blood emergency. Today's weather, sunny and mild, high near... Yes, ghosts haunt places. Traditionally, they haunt large, decrepit mansions with long halls, extensive staircases, and musty attics. But these big old edifices have all disappeared from our landscape. And it is more than likely that the ghost of today has to restrict himself to one-bedroom apartments with bath, kitchenette, and dining area. Poor ghosts. Will they give up haunting altogether? Or will they do what we have done? Adjust. Melba? You have my number? Yes, Leonard. Both at home and at the office. If there's anything I can do, Melba, anything at all. I'll call you. Bless you, my dear. Oh, Paul. Where are you? Where? gone. And Leonard Whipple was the last to leave. Now I'm all alone. No! I'm not crying. I'm trying to be brave and calm and, and remember everything you told me. Leonard said to call him if I needed anything, but what does that mean? I need my husband. I need Paul. Oh, no, Irene, I couldn't go to the movies. No. I'll just sit here and think about Paul. All the beautiful memories. 22 years of beautiful memories. You know, Irene, I keep thinking all the time of what you said to me after the funeral. You said, Paul will never be really dead as long as he's remembered. I keep saying that over and over. Paul isn't really dead as long as he's remembered. I want to thank you, Irene, for that beautiful thought. It means everything to me. Oh, Melba. Melba. How good, it, Paul? Well, hello. It's Bruce, isn't it? I'm new here. I haven't got everybody straight yet. <laughs> you never will. It doesn't matter. Yes, I am Bruce. Mind if I join you? I wish you would. You had a particularly beatific expression on your face just now as I was floating by. Oh, I was thinking of my wife. My wife, Melba. Yeah, why? Why? Well, actually, because she was thinking of me. Remembering our wedding day, I was touched. You're really very new here, aren't you? Oh, yes, very. At the start, everybody is either touched that they're remembered, apprehensive that they won't be, or furious that they're not. Melba feels that no one is really dead as long as he's remembered. Is that what you want to be? Not really dead? It sounds nice. Well, it isn't. I don't know how you can say that. Because I happen to know. 
from bitter personal experience. My sainted mother remembered me every day of her life after I died, till the day she died and joined me here. Since her arrival, I'm happy to say, we've exchanged precisely six words. A while back, she had the grace to apologize. I'm sorry, son, I didn't understand. Well, those were the six words. Sorry for what? For remembering me. What was she supposed to do? Well, forget, for goodness sakes. I wouldn't expect her to forget immediately, of course. That would be unreasonable. But as soon as possible, put me out of her mind. My life on Earth was over. I'm sure she meant well, your mother. After you're here a while, you'll realize that everybody doesn't mean well. And quite often does a lot of harm. But your mother loved you. Then why not leave me alone to enjoy myself? Why wake up in the middle of the night to remember how handsome I looked the day I graduated from dental college? So inconsiderate. Why was it inconsiderate? Because, my dear fellow, if she kept it up long enough, I'd have to stop whatever I was doing and go visit her. Visit her? How could you do that? How? Well, the way it's always done. As a ghost, of course. Irene? It's me. Mm. All right, I guess. Leonard was here. We sent out for Chinese food. He left about an hour ago. Oh, I'm just sitting here and remembering. I got out the old picture album to show Leonard. Mm. I don't think Leonard cares too much for travel. I wasn't sorry when he left. Looking at the snapshots and remembering the beautiful life I had with Paul, it seemed to bring him closer. Oh, I mean it, Irene. A couple of times, I, I felt as though he was right here in the room with me. Honestly. <laughs> Oh, Bruce. Is that you, Paul? I had a terrible time finding you. Well, now you have. I asked everybody where you were and nobody knew, and then Salome said, oh, he's probably out strolling among the stars. That's his favorite pastime. But I had no idea how many stars there are. You still haven't any idea. Actually, neither have I, and I've been here heaven knows how long. So far, this is my favorite galaxy. But, of course, I haven't seen them all. Has anyone, do you think? Oh, I suppose he has. He must have seen everything since the beginning of time. And before that? Ah, uh, yes. What made you come looking for me? Something special? Bruce, I can't get a moment to myself on account of Melba, your wife. You know what she did. She got out an old snapshot album and started looking over all the pictures we took on our vacations, birthdays, Christmases. Typical. They all do it. The worst part is she showed all these pictures to a friend of mine, of hers, ours, Leonard Whipple. He couldn't have cared less. She's really hanging on to you, isn't she? It's very nice of her and all that, but it's it, it's terribly exciting for me being here. Everything's so completely different. Oh, 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 oh. There she goes again, hear her. Oh, oh dear. Dear Paul. Hear that? Vaguely. She just keeps after me and keeps after me. Well, what me. about this Leonard Whipple? Well, he's a very nice guy, but he's not going to hang around much longer if she makes him look at pictures of our honeymoon in the Grand Canyon. Mm. You couldn't just ignore her, I suppose. Well, she's my wife, and I love her. I mean, she was my wife, and I did love her. But now, things are different. I'd say so. <sighs> well, for goodness sake, look there. If it isn't him. Him? You mean it? Really? Him? I haven't seen him in Eon. I never have. Uh, sir? Sir? Please? Hmm? No. Yes, yes, it's Bruce. Yes. Am I right? Yes, sir. And this is Paul. He's new. I know. Hello, Paul. I... I'm really thrilled to meet you, sir. The galaxy is looking well, don't you think? Oh, I love this galaxy, sir. You set it out so neatly. Mm. There's one star I've been concerned about. I think it's beginning to twinkle out. Uh, sir, as long as we were so fortunate as to run into you like this, could we have your advice about something? You know I dislike giving advice. It's for me, sir. I don't know what to do about my wife. 
Is she here? Oh, no. She's with the living. On Earth. Oh. And she's grieving. Well, that's to be expected. She'll stop after a while. She doesn't show any signs of stopping. I, I was wondering if I shouldn't, you know, appear to her. Bruce says it's a simple procedure. Well, you could do that, of course. I never thought very highly of that ghost business, so theatrical. But if it'll make her feel better? I suppose we do owe a measure of responsibility to the living. You think I could go back for a short visit? Well, you're free to do as you like. If I were to tell you what to do, you wouldn't be free anymore, would you? Well, if you just tell me what you think. No, I really can't do that. That would be tantamount to telling you what to do because of me being who I am. You see, you think I have all the answers. Everybody thinks so. Well, I don't. There are countless things I haven't found answers to. <laughs> However, like everyone else, I keep trying. Now, if I really have to go to see if that poor star is feeling any pain. You'll both excuse me. He wasn't much help. Well, that's his way. Oh, dear. Oh, there she goes again. Bruce, I'm going to turn ghost and visitor. At least you've made a decision. How do I go about it? Well, there are no hard and fast rules. Actually, not many of us do it if it, it's considered kind of freaky. Freaky? Look how many of us there are and how few of them. If we all took to ghost walking, we'd have them outnumbered trillions to one. I don't care. I want to do it. I just need to know how. Well, you can do it in the old-fashioned way. Clanking chains, winds whistling through the trees, moon behind black clouds and all that. Uh, I don't think Melba would go for that. Well, then there's the crying, sobbing type of ghost. Inconsolable weeping. Since I don't feel particularly inconsolable. Well, then there's the ghost that flits through the halls, appearing and disappearing. Now you see it, now you don't. No, we don't have a hall, just a rather small foyer. Mm. Uh, can't I just appear in some simple, straightforward way? Just say, here I am, dear. You wouldn't want to start with one weird, uncanny shriek. I wouldn't know how. Or a sardonic laugh. Well, what would I be laughing at? Oh, life, death, anything in between. Well, if you don't want to do any of those things, things which he calls theatrical, then just appear. That's more my style, I think. But wrap a bit of vapor around you. After all, they need something to identify you by. And don't stay too long. And above all, don't let it depress you. Why should it depress me? Mm. You'll find out, my friend. You'll find out. It never occurred to me that a visitation by a ghost could be depressing. Take now that well-known ghost of Hamlet's father, speaking spookily from the battlements at Elsinore. Of course, he didn't sound happy. How could he when his own brother had just killed him and promptly married his widow? He sounded angry, yes. Vengeful, yes. But depressed, no. And certainly not depressing, I'll return shortly with Act Two. Inside your free, inside your free after all, you hear freedom spirit like a wild bird call. Inside your free, inside your free after all, living free. long stretch of open road before you, and you're at the controls of a Buick Century, a really fine mid-sized car. Comfort abounds. A sophisticated suspension system is smoothing the way, and under hood, a frugal V6 engine economically goes about its business. You're happy, you're free, and you're in a Buick. Inside your Did you know that more children die from being hit by automobiles and from any other cause? 10,000 pedestrians and cyclists are killed, and another 500,000 are injured in our country every year. 
And most of these casualties happen to children, especially after dark. There is something to keep your children safer after dark. A safety kit of hot dots, reflective stick-ons that give off a blast of light. Drivers can see them from 600 feet away. Protect your children at night and on dark school mornings. Stick hot dots on bicycles, clothing, books, lunch boxes. Get your hot dots kit free at Northwest Federal Savings, one block west of Cicero Avenue on Irving Park Road, or in displays on Dempster Street, just east of the Tri-State Tollway. But hurry, our supply is limited. A message from Northwest Federal Savings to help keep your children safer after dark. Moribund hero Paul has decided to return to Earth as a ghost and haunt the three-room apartment where he once lived with his wife, Melba. He has simply draped what remains of him in a shred of celestial vapor. And now, as he gazes through the living room window of what used to be his own tenth-floor apartment, he can scarcely be distinguished from the melting moonlight that floods the room inside. Nothing's changed. She hasn't changed a thing. Let's take our coffee into the living room, Leonard. Good idea. I think I picked the wrong time. Bring in that plate of cookies, will you? Right. Not those same old oatmeal things. I've always been crazy about oatmeal cookies. They were Paul's favorites. Set them down there. Mm -hmm. Cream in your coffee? Sugar? Uh, Black, please. No sugar. That's the way Paul took his. His after-dinner coffee in the morning, cream and sugar, yes, but after dinner, nothing. Is that so? And milk in his tea. You don't say. That's the English way, you know, milk and tea. I didn't know Paul was English. He wasn't. Oh, I see. Oh, way back, five, six generations, he was English, but... I, myself, was born in Wales. Is that so? Oh, well, that's near England. Richard Burton is Welsh, you know. For goodness sakes. Well, didn't you know that? The last movie Paul and I saw together had Richard Burton in it. I I wanted to show you something fascinating. Paul's World War II uniform. I've saved it all these years. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, not tonight. And his captain's bars. Some other time. I, I've really got to be moving on. Oh, if you really have to. Such a beautiful night. I think I'll walk home. Yes, a beautiful night. Oh, just look at the moonlight streaming through that window. Care to walk a ways with me in the moonlight? Oh, no, I don't think so, Leonard. I have a lot of things to do here. Well, if there's anything you need, you have my number. Yes. At home and at the office... Good night, Melba. Thanks for dinner. Thank you for bringing all that fried chicken. Oh, it it was nothing, really. Good night. Good night, Leonard. Oh, Paul. Dear Paul. I need you, Paul. Melba. I need you so. I'm right here. What was that? I said... I'm here. Paul? Yes. Me. Paul. But... But... Where? By the window, dear. I can't see you. I'll step inside. That'll be better. Oh, I see... I I see something. You see me. I dare say I've changed somewhat. Can that be you? It is. I. Really, you? Well, fairly, really. Everything considered as real as I can get. Oh, I... I can't believe it. Believe it, Melba. Oh, Paul. How are you? Oh, never mind about me. How are you? Oh, I'm all right. Really? All right? Everything considered... Everything considered, I'm better than all right. Paul, tell me, are you happy? Happy? I must know. Are you happy? 
I'm sorry you asked me that question. Why should you be sorry? Happy just isn't a word we use. Why not? Because it it doesn't mean much once you've died. Oh, Paul, you're not saying you're unhappy. No, I'm not saying that. Then what are you saying? Look, Melba, I didn't really come here to talk about me. What about you? Well, naturally, I'm not happy. Why not? Without you? What about Leonard Whipple? Oh, him. What's the matter with Leonard? Oh, nothing's the matter with him. He's just not you. Well, I'm not me either. Not the way I was before I... Oh, but I remember you the way you were. And as long as I remember... Melba, honey, I don't even remember me the way I was. You don't? Not very well. You remember me, don't you? Sort of. Sort of? Well, you were my wife. I'm still your wife. Not exactly. There'll never be anyone for me but you. Never, I swear it. Please, Melba. We are man and wife forever, for eternity. And now that I know you can return to me, not in the flesh perhaps, but even like this. It's strange. It's weird, but it's enough for me. I can live on as your wife and on and on till I join you. Melba. You don't know what you're saying. Oh, I knew you could never really die as long as I remembered you. And you see, here you are, living on. Hello, Irene. Me. Guess what? You'll never guess. Paul was here. Yes. Yes, yes. Right here in this living room. All right, then he's a ghost, whatever. Well, he looked different. Yes, yeah, sort of steamy. Kind of like a, a street light on a foggy night. But I knew it was Paul, all right. His voice and the things he said and the way he called me Melba, dear. Well, it, he didn't say too much. I, I asked him, was he happy? Because naturally I wanted to know, but he wouldn't say. He wouldn't say he wasn't unhappy either. Isn't that weird? He wanted to know about me. Am I happy? <laughs> Isn't that sweet? And he asked about Leonard Whipple. Imagine him knowing I've been seeing Leonard off and on. Of course, I told him Leonard doesn't mean a thing to me, that there could never be anyone else for me. I said, Paul, we are man and wife for eternity. I said, you can never truly die, Paul, as long as I remember you. And then, you know what, Irene? There was this big, great big noise, a crash sort of. Not like thunder, more like, like music, like a chord out of Beethoven or somebody. And all of a sudden, he was gone. But he'll be back. Like you said, no one is really dead as long as he's remembered. <laughs> Sir. Oh, oh, sir. May I speak with you? Hmm? No. Oh, it's uh, Paul, isn't it? Sir, uh, could I have just a moment of your time? I have all the time in the world. I have all the time there is. Well, I don't quite know how much time there is, but I do know I have all of it. Uh, does that star look all right to you? Well, I, I wouldn't know. I, I don't quite know how a star is supposed to look. Please, sir, may, Oh, may I... yes, 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 of course. You want to talk to me. Now, what about? I... I've been back to the Earth. My wife kept calling me. You said we owed some responsibility to the living, did so I... Did I say that? Yes, sir, you did. Hmm. I wonder if I was right about that. These Earth trips can be very upsetting... Mine was. My wife wanted to know, am I happy? They're all so preoccupied with happiness, aren't they? I didn't know what to say to her. I, I couldn't answer her. This woman I'd been married to for half my life, I couldn't talk to her. It was as though we were living in two different worlds. Well? Oh. Oh, oh yes, I, I see what you mean. Still, shouldn't I have been able to answer her? Well, what could you have said? Well, that, 
that happy is a word that doesn't mean anything anymore. Happy is nothing without unhappy. The way pleasure is nothing without pain. The way health is nothing without illness. Euphoria is nothing without depression. Oh, you know what I mean, sir. I do know, yes. It's ridiculous to say I'm happy when I'm never unhappy. What I am is... What you are is... What? What I am is... Free. Yes. I'm free. I'm Paul, and I'm free. And I'm free to be Paul, no more, no less than me. Me, Paul. Sir, why couldn't I be free like that before? Ah, oh, dear, I ask myself that same question all the time. The only answer is that I miscalculated somewhere. And I did give those people the power to think, to reason, to figure out the sensible way to do things. Why don't they use what I gave them? Why leave everything up to me? Theirs isn't the only planet in the universe, you know. I do have other things to look after, but the way they call out to me, they want me to do everything. Well, it's, it's, it's not right. It really is not right. No, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Well, what's done is done. They'll just have to muddle through the best way they can. Uh, now, about your wife. Uh, Melba, is it? Yes, sir. Mm. Tell you what. Why don't you talk to Bruce about it? You two seem to get along so well. Yes, yes. Talk to Bruce. Now, excuse me, will you? Um, I really do have to go take a look at that poor star. Bruce, he just wasn't any help at all. Now, you listen, Paul. Suppose you had invented the greatest machine imaginable. One that would do, uh, oh, practically anything you can think of. How would you like it if somebody came running to you every time a bolt got loose and asked you to tighten it? But, Bruce, Melba says she's going to go on remembering me forever. We'll be man and wife forever till she joins me here and then we'll still be man and wife. Maybe once she gets here, she'll change her mind. But she's only 42. She'll be remembering me for years and years and calling for me and I'll have to put on that vapor stuff and haunt the apartment... And, and, Bruce, it's so hard to carry on a conversation with her now. It didn't used to be, but now... Well, you, you couldn't just ignore her. I love her, Bruce. Do you? Well, I did. For a very long time, right up to the moment I died. My last words were, I love you, Melba. At least, that's what I meant to say. I know I had it in my mind to say that, but I'm not... Positive I ever got around to saying it. Anyway, I can't just... just brush her off. My, my. You do have a conscience, don't you? Well, I hope so. It's a very fine thing to have, of course, but sometimes... Look, there's only one thing you can do. What? Get married. G married? To, to... to Melba? No, not to Melba, you idiot! How could you marry Melba? She's there and you're here. Some marriage that would be. But then, uh, who... Whom would I marry? Oh, heavens to Betsy, Paul. The place is full of women. Have you ever seen Helen? Helen who? Helen of Troy, they call her. Actually, I've never met her myself, but from what they tell me... <laughs> Marriages are made in heaven. So it's been said. There are those who consider this a profoundly true observation, while others think it one of the silliest statements ever made. I myself have no opinion, at least none that I care to express here. But no one, so far as I know, has ever claimed that people actually get married in heaven. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Give your hand. Congestion. Then take 
make 12-hour contact. You need six cold tablets, two every four hours, or three ounces of cold liquid, one every four hours, or just one contact for up to 12 hours continuous relief of those symptoms. The tiny time pills do it. Both the others contain things for aches and fever. The liquid, something for coughs, not found in contact. Your cold, your choice. Hi, Mal Belairs here, speaking for your local Culligan man. I'd like to put the record straight on a popular misconception. Lake Michigan water is not soft. According to a U.S. Department of Interior water study, only water containing less than three and a half grains of hardness per gallon is classified as soft water. By comparison, Lake Michigan water contains about eight grains of hardness per gallon, And that is a big difference. Now, what does this mean to you? Simply this. Soft water, truly soft water, provides you and your loved ones with so many outstanding benefits that you owe it to your family to at least see a comparison of the difference right in your own home. And there is no cost or obligation. I assure you, whether you have Lake Michigan water or other than Lake Michigan water, you'll be astounded. But prove it to yourself. Pick up the phone and say... Hey, call your man! This is WBBM Chicago, News Radio 78. Melba was a wonderful wife to Paul. But as his widow, she leaves something to be desired. Two things. She won't stop desiring him, and she won't leave him alone. In his desperation, Paul has gone to his kindred spirit, Bruce, for help. The only advice Bruce could offer was for Paul to marry again. Not his earthly wife, Melba, but one of the heavenly creatures who, like Paul, expect to live on forever in whatever place it is they live on forever in. You definitely burned yourself out, little one. Too bad. Sir... Oh, sir. Now, look, Paul, this dear little star has burned itself out. Well, I knew it wouldn't be long. Uh, Sir, I did what you told me to. I talked to Bruce about my problem, and you know what he said? He said, get married. Married? He says the only way to make Melba forget me is for me to get married to someone else. Someone here. Where else? What do you think of the idea? Why do you keep asking me what I think? Can't you ever think for yourself? Well, I just thought... No, no, you didn't. You came running to me like all the others. I'm getting tired of it. If you could give me a little advice... I gave you a little advice. I said, talk to Bruce. You talked to Bruce, and he told you what he thought you should do. Now, either do it or don't do it. Is it all right? Is uh, what all right? To get married. Here. Paul, the essence of this place is perfect freedom to do as you choose. It might work out, it might not. But that's true of everything, isn't it? It's certainly true of everything I do. Do many people get married here? Well, I don't know. I do know they don't come running to me to ask, is it all right? Bruce mentioned someone called Helen. Helen of Troy? Are you asking me to pick a wife for you? Now, what else do you want me to do? Tie your shoelaces? Help you with your arithmetic? Don't you people ever grow up? I'm sorry, sir. I don't care about your being sorry. That's too easy. I care about your achieving some measure of maturity. A bit of independence. A little simple sense. Is that asking too much? Tell me, is that really asking too much? Oh, sir, I... Sometimes I feel like giving up on the whole human race. You're not going to cry, are you, sir? Why not? Who has better reason to cry than I have? Nobody, I guess. Uh, However, we must all carry on, mustn't we? Never give up. That's my motto. Because if I gave up... Uh, Don't say it, sir. Please, don't say it. No. No, I won't say it. 
I wouldn't be so cruel, no matter how provoked. Now, Paul, I really must go tend to that poor little star who, believe me, needs my help more than you do. Irene? It's me. Oh, just sitting around. Leonard asked me to go to that new steak place with him, but I said no. I didn't feel like it, that's why. Don't be silly. I like Leonard. He's a very nice man, but... You know, there's a beautiful moon out tonight, and I thought maybe... Oh, for heaven's sakes, what's that? Well, there was a terrible clanking noise just now and scared me to death. Oh, how could it be the radiator? The heat's not turned on yet. Is there a storm coming up or something? That, that whistling sound, can't you hear it? Like a, like a terrible wind. Maybe a hurricane. <laughs> what do you mean you don't hear anything? Oh, there goes the moon. It must be a hurricane. I mean, the moonlight will stop shining. How can it be shining where you are and not here? Oh, now it's shining here, too. <laughs> Irene. Oh, are you there? Oh. Are you crying about something? Oh, I thought you were. No, no reason, I just thought I heard... Well, I heard somebody crying. More than crying, really sobbing. Oh, oh, oh my goodness. Something just ran through the room. I, how do I know what? It disappeared into the kitchen. <laughs> Irene, there's something here in the kitchen. It's, it's laughing, terrible laughing. It couldn't be Paul because, because it couldn't be. Paul doesn't behave that way. He just comes to the window and says, "Here I am, Melba dear." It couldn't be Paul. Here I am, Melba dear. <gasps> he just said it. Here I am, Melba dear. Melba. I am here. Irene, I'm going to hang up. I've got to find out if it's Paul. And if it is Paul, I've got to know why he's behaving so peculiarly. No, no, don't come over. You you might scare him away. I mean, after all, I'm used to these things and you're not. Bye, Irene. Hello, Melba. Paul, is it you? No, it's not Paul. <gasps> oh, don't be frightened. I'm Bruce. Bruce? Who? I don't know any Bruce. I'm Paul's new friend. His best friend, actually. But why are you here? Why isn't Paul here? He couldn't make it tonight. Why not? Nothing's happened to him, has it? What could happen? Well, nothing, I suppose. Everything's already happened. Precisely. Well, then why isn't he here? I've thought about him and thought about him every single day and every time I woke up during the night. I've been over every moment of every day of every year we had together. That's just him. I'm just about to start over at the beginning. Uh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Why not? He's not really dead as long as I remember him. He's not really alive either, is he? Well, no, but... Melba, you're wearing him out with all this remembering. Wearing him out? Yeah, back and forth, back and forth. It's very tiring, Melba. You mean he'd rather just stay where he is? I think so. Oh, nobody wants to be dead and forgotten. Wait till it's your turn. I certainly don't want to be. Wait, you'll find out. Nobody wants to be dead and forgotten. That's because they haven't tried it yet. You mean... To tell me that Paul wants to be forgotten? By me? If you think you could manage it. Forget 22 beautiful years? Oh, I, I couldn't. I, I couldn't possibly. What about having 22 more beautiful years with somebody else? Like who? Well, I've heard nice things about a certain Leonard Whipple. Leonard Whipple? I've heard he's very devoted to you. But Leonard's not Paul. Leonard could never be Paul. But he could be Leonard, couldn't he? 
if you'd let him? Paul is the only man for me. Always was, always will be, and that is that. Oh, Melba, Melba. Why do you say, oh, Melba, Melba, like that? Because you forced me to tell you something I really have no right to tell you. What? What is it? Hardly anybody knows about it. Just me. And Paul, of course. What is it? I shouldn't repeat it. No. My lips are sealed. It's too private. Does it concern Paul? Is it about Paul? You won't mention it to a living soul? I won't mention it to anybody. What is it? Paul. Paul is getting married again. Paul? Is getting married again? Yes. Who to? I think her name is Helen. Is she pretty? I've never met her, but I hear she is very pretty. <sighs> Young? I believe so. Oh, how could he? How could he? That's life, Melba. Life? Paul's not alive. True, but you are, Melba. Yes, I am. Make the most of it. That's my advice to you. Thank you, Bruce, for telling me what you told me. I really appreciate it. You're quite welcome. I don't suppose Paul would ever have told me himself. Oh, eventually he would have. Maybe. Maybe not. Well, if you see him, tell him I hope he's very happy with his Helen. I'll tell him. Nice to have met you, Melba. Very nice to have met you, too, Bruce. I... Are you still sitting down or standing up? I can't quite tell. Does it really matter? Well, I'd just like to... I don't know, shake your hand or something. <laughs> Not necessary. Not necessary at all. I... I could see you to the door. No, let's just part this way. A fond adieu to you, Melba. A fond... Oh. He's gone. Just... Well, that's the way with ghosts. Oh. Who needs ghosts anyway? With all their comings and goings and the way they talk, who can understand them? Hello, Irene? Irene, you are absolutely not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. You simply will not believe it. Bruce. Bruce, where have you been? I've been looking all over for you. Even Salome didn't know where you were. Where were you? I went to see your wife. Melba? What for? To tell her you were getting married. Bruce, you had no right to do that. Here, we do as we choose. He told you that. How did she take it? Shocked, of course. Hurt. What you'd expect. You could have told me you were going to tell her. I knew you wouldn't let me. I wouldn't have. For one very good reason. It's not true. What's not true? That I'm getting married. You changed your mind? Not exactly. I asked Helen. Yes? She said absolutely not. She says she's not the marrying type. But you didn't stop right there, did you? There are others. I asked Catherine. Uh, uh, I can't pronounce her last name. She used to be an empress in Russia. She laughed, fit to kill. And so did Amy and Louise and Marie. Even Salome laughed at me. Are you upset? Well, nobody likes to be laughed at. Yes, I'm upset. But on the other hand, I'm relieved, too. Bruce, I really don't want to get married. I never thought you did. Everything's so nice here, so... Free and sort of uninhibited. So peaceful. Leonard, it's Melba. You don't mind my calling you at your office, do you? Oh, that's good. How was the new steak place? You didn't go? On account of me, you didn't go? Well, I must say, Leonard... I, I spent the evening doing various things. Things that really needed to be done. Like, I got all Paul's clothes together and packed them in boxes. And tomorrow, I'll send them to some deserving charity. <laughs> Listen, Leonard, I was thinking, 
As long as you didn't go to that steak place, why don't you come over here tonight and I'll cook you the best steak you ever tasted. And hash brown potatoes. Would you like that? Oh, good. Well, come early and we'll have a martini first. <laughs> Melba. Good for Leonard. And good for Bruce. And for Paul, too. Good for everybody who faces up to a problem and solves it the best way possible. The solution may not be a perfect one. Solutions seldom are. But at the very least, they are an attempt to use the sense we were born with. And that's all God asks of any of us. I'll be back shortly. Some people think we play ping pong all day. They're wrong. The USO isn't all fun and games. Today, the USO has millions of problems like this one in Germany. My family's going crazy living in a tiny apartment. Where can we live? Today's USO has millions of problems like this one in Asia. I'm hooked on drugs. Where can I get help? Or this problem in Athens. Our marriage is breaking up. Can you help us? Today's USO has little time for ping pong. We've got serious work to do. We've got lots of new problems here and overseas. The problems are big. How big? Well, if someone asks you, who needs the USO? Tell them, we do, we do. Over 5 million American military personnel and their families need today's USO. And because we get no government funds, we need all your support. Please give to USO through the United Way or local USO campaign. You do realize, don't you, that the story I've just brought you is all pure fantasy. I don't know any more than you do what happens to us once we have resigned this terrestrial life, and you know as little as I do. Unless, of course, you are a ghost. Oh, if you are, I wish you'd get in touch with me. I have gobs and gobs of things I'm dying to ask you, like, uh, like, uh, well, for one thing, are you happy? Our cast included Lenka Peterson, Elliot Reed, Robert Dryden, and Gordon Gould. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. <laughs> Now, a preview of our next tale. Not there. For God's sake, child. Why not? That's the haunted villa. You? Superstitious? About that place. Anyway, it's boarded up. Has been for years. But there's the house now. Maybe we can find some shelter. I can't look. It's bright as molten steel. It's gone. Melted. It's never been. Let's get out of here, Charles. I could swear I saw that thing jump and run into the house. Oh, dear. Maybe it's on fire. No, it's, it's lamplight. Look. The door is open. Welcome, Frank. Ah, oh, this is the night to be abroad. Welcome to the Villa de Desbois. The House of Despair. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... Hey, weirdos. Our next Weirdo Watch Party is this Saturday, August 17th, with weirdo family favorite Mistress Malicious and her crew from Mistress Peace Theater. This time, Mistress is bringing us a film from 2015 entitled Killer Piñata. A possessed piñata seeking to avenge the savagery that humanity has inflicted on his kind picks off a group of friends one by one in an unending night of terror. I'm going to take a wild guess and say this is more comedy and less creeps, but we'll find out. The fun begins this Saturday night 
August 17 at 7 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Mountain, 9 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Eastern on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. The Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch. Just tune in at showtime and watch the movie with me and other Weirdo family members, and even join in the chat during the film for more fun. It's Mistress Malicious presenting Killer Piñata this Saturday night, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. You can see a trailer for the film now and watch horror hosts and B-movies for free anytime on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash TV. See you Saturday! Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Why, what's the matter? You seem a bit nervous. Has the cemetery outside this house upset you? There are things far worse than cemeteries. For instance, being lost in an Arctic storm, as in the story I want to tell you tonight. The story I call Survival of the Fittest. My story, Survival of the Fittest, begins in the cold, bleak wastes of Alaska, stretching endlessly as far as the eye can see. In one vast white expanse, the fierce winter wind hurls itself at a small cabin almost buried by the snow. In the cabin, four men are huddled around the end of a fire. Mike, what are we going to do? We're leaving the first thing in the morning for Goldfield. In this storm? It's either make a try for Goldfield or die here of starvation. Mike's right, Paul. We're to stay here, our food would be gone in five days. Much better we try to get to town. Kiana... How's the weather look to you? You think it'll blow over by tomorrow? Storm bad. Not blow over soon. All right, that settles it. We're getting out of here first thing in the morning. How far do you think we've come in these four days, Mike? I should say about 70 miles. That means 50 more miles to Goldfield. Yeah, it's going to be a hard 50 miles, too. Dogs are all worn out. We only have food enough for one day. Mike, you don't think we'll have any trouble making it, do you? In this country, you always have trouble. Only the strong and ruthless survive. Hold up! Hold up! Here! Kiana! Come here! Here come! Why are you calling Kiana, Mike? Kiana's having trouble breaking trail for the dogs. He's slowing us down, eating food that might pull us through. He's no longer useful to us. Uh, I'd be here. Kiana! What do you want? I'm afraid we don't need you anymore. You not understand, huh? Maybe this will make you understand. Mike, somebody... No, don't! Oh. <laughs> you... You've killed him. Yeah, I had to. I told you only the strong can survive. We need the food he'd have eaten. Paul, you start breaking trail for the dogs. We're going on. Come on! <laughs> Mike, it's been two days since we've eaten anything. We can't go on without food, Mike. Why don't we kill one of the dogs? Yeah. Because we need every dog we have to pull the furs on the sled. All right, Paul. Start breaking trail for the dogs. We've rested enough. No, I can't. I'm too tired. The dogs can break their own trail. Why, you young whelp. Oh, my head. Shoot me. Like you did, Kiana. You're not worth wasting a bullet on. If you're too tired to break trail, you can remain behind. Boy, Mike, you can't leave him here to die. Oh, can I? Are you ready, Victor? Yes, I'm ready. Paul, run along behind the sled. All right, Victor. Mush! Mush, get here! Hey. Mike! Mike, why don't you let me throw away this bundle of furs I'm carrying? Then I could break trail for the dogs. Throw away $500 worth of furs? I should say not. Come on! Mush! Paul! Oh, hey, uh, oh, don't stop behind. Keep running. I will, Victor. As long as I can. Mike! Mike, look! The dog disappearing! Victor, let go of the sled! Mike, like the dogs inside, they're vanishing that crevasse in the ice. Yeah, 
A year's furs lost in a few seconds. What do we do now? Eh? Now we'll start floundering through the snow towards Goldfield. If our strength holds out, we'll make it. If it doesn't, we'll die. Right now, Doctor, I've got a quickie mystery of my own I'd like to solve. A mystery? mystery of two men. You see, these two gentlemen are both nice-looking fellows, act alike, talk alike, even wear similar clothes. Yet there is a difference. The appearance of one somehow seems more distinguished than the other. Ah, <laughs> you've guessed it. The solution to the mystery is simple. One man always wears an Adam hat. Yes, gentlemen, the perfect style and quality of an Adam does make a difference. A difference that all well-dressed men recognize at a glance. Made of rich-looking all-fur felt, the new Adam hats come in a wide variety of distinctive styles and shapes and are priced at only $3.45 to $10 at Adam hat stores and authorized dealers from coast to coast. Mister, if you want to look your best always, always wear an Adam. Now, Dr. Weir. And now I'll finish my story, Survival of the Fittest. It is early the next morning. Three figures, mere specks on the vast white expanse, make their way slowly and painfully across the snow. Finally, one, unable to go any further, stops and sinks into the snow. Mike, Mike, wait! Uh, Fall's falling down! Paul, you must get up and keep going. <sighs> if you don't, you'll freeze to death. I can't walk another step like that. I'm too tired. Ah, so he's falling down, eh? Well, Paul, you'll either get up and start walking or stay behind and die. Uh, Mike, if each of us took him by the arm, we could help him along. Nothing doing. It's every man for himself. I'm not going to waste my strength. Paul, Paul, you must get up. Here, let me help you. No, leave me alone. I can't go any further. Mike, we can't leave him here to die. Why can't we? Because it's inhuman. It's common sense. The weak die and the strong live. Now, are you going on with me, or are you going to stay behind to die with him? Paul, Paul, you must get up. Can't you see nothing can save him now? He's half frozen already. Are you coming, Victor? Yes, I'm coming, Mike. Goodbye, Paul. May the Lord have mercy on your soul. As the uh, two men continued on their way, the snow swept over Paul's body and soon hid it from sight. Hour after hour, Mike and Victor struggled along. For the first time in days, they saw the sun and its warmth helped them to withstand the cold. Well, late that afternoon, Victor began to fall behind. Mike, Mike, wait for me. Hurry up. I'm coming as fast as I can. Ah, you'll never get Goldfield at this rate. Must be at least another ten miles. Ten miles? I'll never make it without food. My stomach feels as though... Like uh, you're eating something. Yeah, that's right. You're, you're eating pemmican. Where'd you get it? Get it? I had it all the time in this pouch. You mean... You mean the food didn't run out four days ago? It ran out for you and Paul, but not for me. I just finished eating the last of it. So you stole the food that might have saved Paul and myself. <laughs> you're nothing but a dirty murderer. A murderer and a thief. Do you hear? Yeah, but when all's said and done, Victor, I'm going to live and you're going to die. Someday, Mike, you'll pay for your crime. <laughs> and when that day comes... Hey, listen, a plane. Where is it? My eyes. Everything's a little blurry. Oh, yeah, yeah, there it is. Look. A plane. It's coming this way. They see us. It's an army plane. They dropped something. A package. Food. That's what it is. Yeah, and look. Look, it landed in the snow. Only a hundred yards from it. Yeah, where? Darn that sun in my eyes, I can't see it. Yeah, 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 I see it now. That package will do me nicely until I reach Goldfield. I'll make it for sure now. Well, there's plenty for both of us in it, Mike. You are going to share it with me, aren't you? All you're going to get is this son. I won't have you telling any tales about me later. After I pick up that package, I won't be back. Mike, Mike, come back. Don't leave me here to die. Where did that package drop? I thought I... Oh, oh there it is over there, half burying the snow. Funny, first I can see it, then I can't. I... Oh, my eyes. Oh, they feel as if knives are being stuck into them. 
I can't see. What's happening to me? My eyes, I'm snow blind. That's it. The glare of the sun all day. I'm snow blind. Victor! Victor, where are you? I'm back here, Mike. Victor, you gotta help me. I can't see a thing. I'm snow blind. You mean, you mean you can't see anything? No! No, my eyes hurt so I can't stand it. It's the sun, the glare all day. That's done it. My eyes feel as if they were full of needles whenever I open them. Oh, oh, what do you want me to do, man? Now look, crawl over the package. You still have enough strength and bring it over here. It'll keep us alive. In a day or two, I'll be able to see again, and I'll get us both in the gold field. I, I can't, Mike. My legs are too stiff. What? I can't move them. We'll both die here now. now. Now, now, I won't die. I won't. I'll find that food myself. I know which direction it was in. I can find it if I hunt long enough. That's what you think. Yeah, you're just trying to confuse me. It's in this direction. I know it is. I can feel the sun on my face. Mike, Mike, come back. Stop. Come back. <laughs> I am going right. Or you wouldn't be trying so hard to stop me. I'll show you, Victor. I'm going to live, you hear? I'm going to live. And you're going to die. No, no, Mike. Come back, Mike. There's a crevasse in the ice ahead of us. You'll fall into it. You expect me to fall for a sucker trick like that? The crevasse was behind me. I remember that. Mike, look out! Okay. Ah! Too bad about Mike, wasn't it? Or was it? It was really his own fault he fell into the crevasse. Because, you see, Mike, being the kind of man no one could trust, he felt he could trust no one. Victor? Oh, yes, Victor lived. He finally managed to get to the package of food and survived until a rescue party could reach him next day. So if you're ever tempted to sacrifice your friends to save yourself, just remember that the... Oh, you have to go now? Well, perhaps you'll drop in again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you. So much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does. So he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past. Absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts.
Roy. Roy. Mm. It's time to get up. Mm. Oh, come on, Roy. Roy. All right. Temper, temper. Mm. You know what you said last night. If I don't get out of bed at once, you have my permission to pull the covers off. You do, and I'll kill you. Oh, come on, love. You know... Oh, brave man. Where are you? Hey, alarm clocks. Where are you? Come on, you... Uh, oh, Roy, there's no time. Roy? What's up? Roy, there's something wrong with my eyes. Roy, Roy? Hey? Can't, 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 can't what? Where are you? I can't see you. Time. The silent herald of life and death. Success or failure. The unseen force that measures man's destiny, reaching its most fateful moment as it slowly strikes. The eleventh hour. What's the matter with your eyes? I, I, I don't know. Nothing. I can see everything else. Well, then. You said just now. Roy, what are you playing at? <clears throat> Look, what the devil's the matter with you, Sally? One of your dreams or something? Roy, where are you? On a number 27 bus bell, that me wit. Where do you think I am? Oh, come on, woman, make some tea. Oh, not to freeze this solid. I don't care how much it costs. We've got to have central heating. Can't stand another winter like this. I'm dreaming. Yes, it's one of those dreams again. In a minute, June Craig will come into the room and tell me she's having an affair with him, and he'll come and beat me up and say he's going away with her. And then I'll wake up and everything will be all right. This dream, I'm insecure. <laughs> I thought it is. My husband loves me, but I'm, I'm insecure. Oh. Bed. Sleep and when I wake up, everything will be all right again. Sally. <gasps> Sally. What, what, what's happened? What, what's going on? Sally, look at me. I, I can't see you. I'm here, standing here in front of you. Where? <laughs> look. Uh, I've, I've just looked, looked in the mirror. The mirror? What? Usual thing. See how I look. Time out. You know. Get, get ready for shaving. And... I do it every morning. Yes, Roy? I couldn't see anything. Couldn't... You? Couldn't see anything. Sally, what happened? Look, Roy, but... I... I Can uh, you see me? No. I'm standing right in front of you. I, I can see you. I can't see you. That's what I was afraid of. I can't see me either. I, I mean, look, I'm... I'm looking at myself now. My hands. I can't see my hands. Can't see my feet. Sally, what's happened? I can hear your voice. Well, better ring the doctor. Doctor? Well, I feel fine. But you've gone. I'm not gone. I'm gone. I'm still here. Look. Uh, no. You... Ring the doctor. I'll, I'll ring the doctor. I... Oh, am I going mad or something? Uh -huh. What? I saw the cupboard door open. I've just opened the cupboard door. Well, it looks as if it was opening on its own. <laughs> what? Your shirt. Well, what about it? I... it it's floating about in midair. Would, would you uh, ring Dr. Matthews, please, dear? Tell him... Can't tell him anything. I'm going back to bed. Just tell him... Ask him to come here. <laughs> Doctor, you mustn't be a... What I mean is... A... Morning, Doctor. You see? That's him. That's Roy. You can see the lump where it's in the bed, but... 
Have you got nothing on you? See him, the doctor? They want me for television. The Invisible Man. Oh, please, because I'm not really here. There. <laughs> not funny. Stop it. You're really right, it's not. What's the matter, Doctor? You look as if you've seen a ghost. <clears throat> Mr. Horsey, um, when, um... This morning. I was all right last night. What, my Sally? Yes, I think so. Think so? You told me I was getting fat. She told me I was getting fat, Doctor, so obviously I could be seen last night. What, what, what are you doing? It's all right, Mr. Horsey. I'm just satisfying myself. Here, get out. Your hands are cold. <laughs> it's not funny. Why are you both laughing? Who's laughing? Well, you wouldn't laugh if your wife suddenly went invisible, Doctor. On the contrary, I'd be delighted. Uh, tongue out, Mr. Horsey. <laughs> oh, no, there's no point, is there? Uh, would you mind putting pyjamas on? You say with clothes on, you can be seen and everything? Yes, but it's a, a bit unnerving. Pyjamas sitting up in bed with nothing in them. <laughs> you see? Yes, yes. Like, like the washing line on frosty mornings. All, all the washing, all stiff and... Well, what's happened to him, Dr. Matthews? God help him. I mean to try, Mrs. Horsey. I mean to try. I see absolutely no point in taking my temperature, Doctor. I've somehow or other disappeared. I haven't got... Oh, just hold on to that for a minute, Mr. Horsey. Mrs. Horsey, may I have a word or two with you, please? Oh, yes, sir. No, we won't be a minute, Roy. Uh, what are you going to talk about that I can't hear? Roy, put that thermometer back in your mouth. Dr. Matthews is trying to help you. <sighs> Doctor, what is it? What's happened to my husband? How can... My dear lady, it's all under control. Under control? But... Your husband is invisible. I know that, but... I shall have an apology to make to both of you later. Uh, but for now, uh, for the present, uh, allow me to explain. Apology? What on earth? Firstly, your husband took his sleeping tablet last night, did he? A sleeping tablet? Well, I... I mean, I didn't know that he could... Yes, yes, he sleeps badly, apparently. He came to me two days ago, weeks tired. It's as if he's not sleeping at all. There are a dozen beverages on the market worth recommending, but with a man like your husband... Oh, what any of this to do with Roy being invisible? I'm coming to that. What happened to Roy? What... I've made him invisible. You? What? Made him invisible. Successful, isn't it? You can't see a thing. Not even his, um, not a single inch of him. You? The sleeping pill wasn't a sleeping pill. It was a little something I've been experimenting on for some time. Oh, what are you? Some kind of witch doctor? Witch? Oh, good heavens, no. Mrs. Horsey, if you only knew, a doctor's life is horrible. But I don't understand what it is. This has got to do with my husband. I demand a second opinion. Quiet, dear lady. Your husband is invisible. My pill prescription works. For the first time in the history of the world, a mortal man has rendered another human being invisible to the naked human eye. Dr. Matthews, what are you saying? You stand there and admit that you use my husband as... as... A guinea pig, yes. Why, you, you... Dear lady, I can make him visible again at will. He will become visible again. He, in fact, uh, even at this moment... Oh, yes. Uh, oh, uh, don't do that, Mr. Horsey. Roy... Where are you? My temperature's 98 point something or other. What's going on? What are you two doing out here? Mr. Horsey, don't say another word. Let us return to the bedroom. There's something I must discuss with you. You're crazy. Not at all. Um, be prepared, Mrs. Horsey, as I've worked it out in another um, three minutes precisely. Your husband will be back with us in the uh, flesh. Well, I really well hope you're right. Wait a minute, though. You have the blasted gall to stand there and tell me you did this on purpose. You made me invisible. Think of it, my friend. You are invisible. Soon you'll become visible once more. At will, I can render you invisible. What a plan. What an idea. You are a bank manager. I'm a chief teller, actually, but go on. You know, suddenly you're beginning to interest me. Uh, how many minutes did you say? No, um, two. Imagine, Mr. Horsey, the greatest robbery of all time. You could not possibly be detected because no one can see you. Roy? No, shut up. Blimey, 
Of course, if I'm not back to my normal self in two minutes' time, I shall kill you anyway, but given that you are serious and this is your doing and not a ruddy great leg pull, I've got to admit it's, um, it's interesting. Yes. <laughs> Huh? Roy, what's up? Roy, Mr. Halsey, welcome back amongst us. You, you mean I'm? Oh, <laughs> darling! Oh, I can see. Look, all of me, arms, legs. Oh, you, you can do this with a pill? I've worked for years. It's a mixture of medieval hocus pocus and early Hindu legend, and it's all in uh, here. Why didn't you try it out on yourself? I'm, uh, uh, I, I'm a bit of a coward. I thought something would go wrong. Oh, right. charming. Really? Uh, how does uh, a million pounds between us strike you? Let's talk about it. risk whatsoever. Mm. How could there be? Ah, every time I leave you two alone, I find you deep in earnest conversation. Look, if I'm being taken for a Roy, ride... Roy, how could all... you? Martin was just telling me how we can steal a million pounds and not be caught. Oh, Martin now, is it? I see. If we're to work together, I think Christian names are necessary, don't you? Hmm. I'll phone the bank, tell them I think I'm getting Asian flu. Good. I'll write you out a prescription. Now, you must go back to work tomorrow, of course. As chief teller, after the manager, you will say the closing of the vaults, etc. This is your responsibility. That's right. Hey, I've just realized something. What's the good of being invisible if everybody's going to see my clothes walking about? You won't wear clothes. I see. You want me to go naked? Exactly. Naked through the streets? You can't do that. He'll be arrested. Oh, no, I see. <laughs> Precisely. You see, but they won't see. <laughs> I'll catch my death a cold. I'll write you out a prescription. A cold, Mr. Horsey, a mere cold. Poof, for half a million. Uh, three quarters of a million. Three ways, and there's two of us. It's, uh, my pill. Who's taking the risks? Anyway. Wait. Dirty bread day. Yes, and, uh, what? Dirty bread day. Last Thursday of every month. All the muck is shoved back to the mint. Lovely, dirty old notes. That's what we want. Genius. I know. It's my job. Your job? Yeah, with Rawlings. Who's Rawlings? He's the bank guard. Uh, it's our job. Last Thursday of every month, we fill the hamper, about nine in the mornings, and it stays there till eleven. Then they come for it. Who? The bods from the mint. Ruddy great armoured car. Very nice, all those old notes, you see. Lovely. Never trace them. Spend them at once, you could. Ah, oh, Paris, Stockholm, the Far East. Rich. Never to see another appendix as long as I live. Our farm in the country, darling. <laughs> get up late. Never get up at all on frosty mornings. Lie in bed with Sally. Beautiful. Oh, doctor, you could only lie in bed with Sally. The yeah, I mean... Uh, yes, well, uh, now let's see. Plan. Yeah. Plan. Ah. Uh, this bank guard. Clever, intelligent. He's a bank guard. Yes, of course. So, you go down with him, yes? That's right. We pack the hamper, check things generally, and then... Wait a minute. The best thing is for you to be invisible, because great minds think alike. Just what I was thinking. <sighs> yeah, darling, make us some coffee. This is getting interesting. <laughs> slip in while me and old Rawlings go in and then and then we go out leaving you in there invisible quite and then you find you've left your glasses or your yeah, uh, bullseyes you find you've left your bullseyes in the vault uh, bullseyes yeah i chew them all the time at work he gave up smoking you see. Oh, yeah now Rawlings drags me about him he smokes like a chimney yeah, in fact he'll want a quick puff while we're down there now he might not come back with me but if he does, you must distract him while I slip out with a hamper. Three doors along from the vault, there's the Southern Electricity Supply Cupboard. It's eight by eight, roughly. Now, I'll have it unlocked that morning. I'll see to all that. Now, in there with the hamper, and then... Oh. How do you... I mean... What if... No, shut up, darling. You haven't got a criminal's mind. It's hopeless. Just help me spend the notes. I um, have it. 
You complain of a headache. Uh, you must go to the chemist. Out you go, you take a pill and return in three minutes. Invisible. Three minutes? That's all it takes, remember? I told you to take the sleeping pill three minutes before you went to bed. So I went invisible as soon as that? I didn't notice. But you probably don't sleep with the light on. I mean, you would feel your husband's um, presence and... Uh, well, I mean... Uh, oh, yes, I felt his presence. I knew he was there all right. <clears throat> Where were we? Ah, you return to the bank... Come to me, and we carry the hamper out together. Two completely invisible men. With a hamper? Yeah, brilliant. Big hamper? It can't fail. No. Nope. Uh, what about this hamper? Look, what you about the hamper? What about the... Oh. Oh, yeah. I didn't think of that. Big hamper floating through the streets, eh? Yeah. Can't give the hamper a pill, can you? Uh, we're left with a problem. Yeah. Let's work on it. Uh, more coffee, love. Dodgy, that is. Big hamper floating down the high street. It's going to be ruddy cold, isn't it? Embarrassing, too, really. So, think. Mm. There we are, both in the cupboard place where all the electricity is. With the hamper of money. Both starters. Yeah, both uh, <clears throat> sans clothes. Now, yes, mustn't leave it to improvisation, must we? Uh, too risky. Hey, uh, this, this pill affair, um... How long... How long what? Well, how long does the invisibility last? As long as I wish it to last. Last evening, I told you to take my pill at 10.30. You told me you were regular to bed. You also said your alarm went off every morning at 6.30. 10.30 to 6.30, a civilized eight hours. I calculated nine and a half and stood by my phone this morning. Stood by? Yes. If your wife hadn't rung when she did, I would have phoned you. I was dressed and ready for the car that sometimes won't start. This morning it did. Don't you, Doctor, you are. Coffee. Sorry, it's him. With the money from the robbery, I shall buy two Rolls Royces. One with a wickerwork side. Yeah, but for the moment, we're both naked in a cupboard with a lot of money. Our goose pimples won't be seen, will they? Don't be frivolous. Think. 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 <laughs> Eureka! Brilliant! So, I will take it upon myself to make sure there's a vacuum cleaner in the electricity cupboard. There always is. That's where Mrs. Champion keeps all the cleaning doings. You're going to stuff the money in the cleaner? And move it. Stuffed with money? Foot by foot, yard by yard. Along the vault corridor and up the stairs, into the lending department and out into insurances and car policies. That way, into the main bank. <sighs> No one will give a vacuum cleaner leaning against the wall a second glance. Of course, one of us in his invisibility will have to go ahead and warn the other of anyone approaching. Yes, yes, you're right. It wouldn't do to have the manager spy a cleaner floating along the corridor. The main bank chamber will be tricky. There's no other way? No. No, through the main bank floor and into savings. Never many people in savings these days. Uh, that's the small left-hand entrance. Now, outside there... You want me with the car? Right. Vacuum cleaner to the door. Leave it there for a moment and then whip it out into the car and away. It's foolproof. Ah, here we go again, Miss Dorsey. Hmm, I love that old note there, I do. Only chance I get to the quiet path. <laughs> You're incorrigible, Rawlings. You should stick to bullseyes. Right, let's get on with it then. <laughs> Wonder how many millions there is today. Just think, it's got to be burned. All that lovely money. It really hurts. Gets you right here. What? I left my bullseyes in the vault. <laughs> I think I'll just whip back for them, eh? I'll wait here. Save my feet. Right, hang on. <laughs> oh, are you there? Phew, I was worried. Everything under control. Doctor. What? There's a big smudge of soot down... Well, it'll be your cheek. Good grief. Uh, it's gone? No. Uh, must be my left. Uh, 
Okay. Wouldn't have done to see a smudge of soot walking about in midair, would it? Right. Have your pill. Right. I've decided on toothache. They wouldn't expect me back too soon. Got your bullseyes, Mr. Horsey, eh? <laughs> Hurry! Miss Crossfield, if anyone needs me, I've got the devil of a toothache. It's killing me. I'll be back soon. You were so long. Uh, is that you, Roy? Huh? It's me. I'm all right. Am I? Can't see an inch of you. Lovely. Everything all right? Every note in. The cleaner's stuff full. Right, let's go. Blimey, the bag won't burst, will it? No. Come on. Right. Mr. Fred, I would never dare come home again if I forgot to post your football coupon that come up. I'd be all quick as a flash to the other side of the world. <laughs> oh, my heart. It won't stand it. Come on. No. Don't move it. There's the manager. Oh. He's looking. He's looking at the cleaner. Oh, no. It's all up. Is of admiring where this was. Oh. <gasps> no. Eh? Who's that? Sunny? Oh. <laughs> says to stop cleaning this minute. How oh, blarmy. You've got to wait till five. Oh, I knew I should never take a job in the bank what stays open late or decent and toes are free. Oh, no. She's taking it away. We're sunk. Doctor, I can see your foot. What? Roy, I can see your... Spoil sports, not letting me get ahead with me cleaning. Oh, this bag hasn't been emptied in years, neither. Chew it, full up. Molly's money. Look at it. God. Oh, well, I, I never did. Here, I, I wonder. Wait a minute. Yes, if you can have a large double quantro, thank you. I've always been partial to a little bit of liquor on my overseas trips, you know. Uh, certainly, madam. Uh, going abroad for long? Oh, few years, perhaps. Always rather fancy Japan. And might push on into Australia. Because suddenly, you know, my husband Fred's always wanted a sheep farm too. Haven't you, Fred? Yes, of course you have. I envy you, madam. Uh, one large quattro. Ah. <laughs> Good heavens. Here. See this, Fred? Two naked men arrested in City Bank yesterday morning. 
two naked men were ap uh, ap uh, were appended in the National and Provincial Bank yesterday afternoon, shortly before closing. They behaved in a very strange manner and both tried to run screaming out of the door. They have been arrested on charges of public indecency. Well, I never did. It's a queer old world we're living in it. I wonder if we like Australia, Fred. Yeah, that's the bank I worked in before I uh, got me little windfall. Isn't that funny? <laughs> The makers of Insto Eye Drops invite you to join them again next Tuesday night at 7.30 as the moment of destiny approaches in the 11th hour. Listen tomorrow night at 8 o'clock when the makers of Insto Eye Drops bring you Playhouse 90. The 11th hour this week was written and produced by Michael McCabe. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. South Pacific. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations presents Escape, produced and directed by William N. Robeson. This, the last of the summer series, is The Fourth Man by John Russell. Numea in the South Pacific. To a generation of French criminals, a word to be uttered in the same terrified breath with Devil's Island. The penal colony at Noumea, where the cutthroats, garroters, and sadists from the dregs of French society were sent to a living death. Tonight we invite you to escape from Noumea in John Russell's The Fourth Man. <laughs> The raft stood to open sea. A mat of pandanus leaves served for its sail and a paddle of wood for its helm. It was woven of reeds and bamboo sticks lashed upon triple rows of bladders and it carried four men. Three of them sat huddled together at the far end. Their bodies were blackened with dried blood and the hair upon them was long and matted. They wore only the rags of blue convicts' uniforms. On wrist and ankle, they carried their mark, the dark and wrinkled stain of the manacles. There was Dubose, doctor, man of the world, murderer. Friends, the thing is done. And Fenerou, forger, ladies' man, weakling, coward. Yes. We've escaped. And the one known as the parrot, thief and cutthroat. So far, so good. <laughs> and by the way of celebration, gentlemen, may I offer you cigarettes? Cigarettes? Oh. <laughs> Doctor, you're a marvel, a magician. Look at them. White and fresh as though they just came from the package. How did you do it? Oh, every six months there are about 75 escapes from Noumea. And not more than one succeeds. Ours would be that one I knew. And so, three weeks ago, I bribed the night guard for these very cigarettes. <laughs> so that we might sit here, my friends, as we are doing, and celebrate. I want a light. A light? 
for the pet. <laughs> our doctor's a wonder. He thinks of everything. He gives us cigarettes, matches, and our freedom. Wait till you've got your two feet on a pavement again. That'll be the time to sound off about freedom. <sighs> to wear starched collars again. To stroll with a girl, clean and fresh from her bath. Down the Place de la Concorde, the Rue de Rivoli. Suppose we get a storm. It's not the season of storms. Just the same. Suppose we get a storm. Perroquet, my friend. <laughs> you must not be so impatient. Remember, we were convicts back there, festering in oblivion. Now we are men raised from the dead. Suppose we get a storm. Uh, you've got a gift of speech, Doctor. But where's the ship that was going to meet us here? This is the day as agreed. It will meet us. The wind will blow us to China if we keep on. We can't lie any closer to shore. There's a government launch at Torian. And I doubt if the native trackers have given us up. <laughs> Careful, Parrot. The natives will eat you yet. <laughs> uh, I've heard about that. Is it true, Doctor, that they'll keep all the runaways they can capture to fatten on? Oh, they prefer the reward still. I I doubt if they've entirely lost the habit of cannibalism. <laughs> piece by piece, Parrot. First they'll sample you. Then they'll make a stew out of your brains. Oh, they won't miss a thing. Shut up, Finneru. The filthy brutes. Oh, I almost forgot. We have one of them with us. <laughs> The fourth man was steering the raft. He sat crouched in the stern, his body glistening with spray. His huge dark hands held the steering paddle. He was motionless, like an idol, his eyes fixed on the course ahead. The fourth man on the raft. You are looking at a Kanak, my friends. You will see nothing superior, no line of beauty to redeem the low angle of the forehead the knobby joints of the body. Nature has stamped him with the mark of inferiority, and he has set the final seal himself with that twist of bark about his middle, that prong of pig ivory through his nose. Yes, but nonetheless, he's a man, and there is a price on our heads. He could be taken as where he likes. Calm yourself, Fenneru. <laughs> this is a very simple animal, an infant, really. Does that mean he couldn't double-cross us? It does. He is bound by his duty. I made my bargain with his chief up the river, and this one is sent to deliver us on board our ship. That's the only interest he has in us. And he'll do it? He will. That is the nature of the native. No, I don't trust him, not for a minute. The brute. The animal. You! It's you I'm talking about! You dirty brute! Save your breath, Parrot. He speaks no language. Only a few noises, a few signs. Well, I don't feel right on the same raft with that. Well, burn yourselves up in the sun if you like, but me. I'm going to crawl under a mat and get some sleep. Yes, we should all sleep a little, conserve ourselves. <laughs> and when we awake, our ship will be here. A saucy little topsail schooner, a mass standing out against the sky and we'll be on our way to France. Yes, sleep, my friends. The two younger convicts dozed under the heat of the day, but not the doctor. He stood once again to sweep the skyline under his shaded hand. His plan had been so careful, so precise, he had counted absolutely on meeting the ship, a small schooner, one of those flitting half-piratical traders of the Copra Islands that can be hired, like cabs in a dark street, for any sinister enterprise. And there was no ship, and there was no crossroads where one might sit and wait. Uh, good morning, Doctor. It's afternoon, Fenero. Oh, yes, so it is. I slept like a corpse. Hey, where's the ship, Doctor? 
It was going to be here when we woke up. It will be. <sighs> oh, I'm thirsty. I'm dying with thirst. So we all, Fenner. Where's the flask? I'm roasted in the sun. You'll just have to roast some more. This crew is put on rations. What are you talking about? Where's that water? I have it here. So you have. Do you think it's yours? No. It's ours, Parrot. I want a drink, Doctor. Think a little, Parrot. We have to guard our supplies like reasonable men. We don't know how long we may be floating here. Oh, so that's how you talk now. You don't know how long. But you were sure enough when we started. I am still sure. The ship will come. She cannot stay for us in one spot. She'll be cruising to and fro until she intercepts us. And we must wait. Huh, that's good. Wait. And in the meantime, what? Fry here in this heat? Our tongues hanging out while you deal us out water drop by drop? Perhaps. No. A man doesn't live who can feed me with a spoon. Unless you would die very speedily, we must guard our water. We can only do our best with what we have. All right, Doctor. Do your best. Give me a drink. You you may have your share, of course. But be warned. When it's gone, don't come to us, to Fenero and me. Yes, what's fair is fair. My drink. Very well. Oh... A thimbleful. One thimble. This way we should have enough for three days, maybe more. We'll equal shares among the three of us. <laughs> That's right. There are only three of us. You, uh, you were thinking of him, Fenero, of our pilot? He looks somewhat like us, doesn't he? But his body has never known clothes. His feet, shoes. His heart has never known the swelling that comes with feelings of love or beauty. His mind has never known a single thought. <laughs> Look at us three, gentlemen. You, Fenero, a forger. You, Parrot, a thief. And I, Dr. Dubose, of Paris and Marseille, a murderer. And yet, we are civilized men. And this is a savage animal. And our provisions are for civilized men only. <laughs> The three men awoke to the second day on the raft. They looked and saw the far round horizon and the empty desert of the sea and their own long shadows that slipped slowly before them over its smooth, slow heaving. The land had sunk away from them in the night. The trap had been sprung. As the savage sun kindled upon them with the power of a burning glass, a calm fell, an absolute calm. The air hung, waited. The sea heaved and fell in polished undulations. And the sun shone, driving in under their eyelids like white-hot splinters. They crawled to the shelter of their mats, gasping, shriveling. And the water, the world of water, was slack and thick as oil. Oh, oh how lonely it is. Dr. DuBose. Yes, Parrot? Look around you. What do you mean? Go on, look around. What do you see? I see water, Parrot, and the horizon. What? Nothing else. Oh, don't you see a ship? A saucy little schooner? Those were your words. Well, where is it? Why don't you see it? It will come. Uh, will it comfort us to be dead when it comes? You... You say that you count on your friends, but suppose they leave you to rot here. Leave Parrot and me to rot here. That would be a joke, eh, Doctor? To wait for a ship that will never come? It will come. My friends will not fail me. Why? How do you know? How can you be so sure? There's a safety vault in Paris, full of papers to be opened at my death. Those papers contain confessions. No, gentlemen, my friends will not fail me. A uh, parrot. Uh, a moment ago, you asked me what I saw. Well, 
There was something I neglected. What's that? I see a Kanak on this raft with us. He does not join us. He does not look at us. He sits on his heels in the way of the native, with his arms hugging his knees. He sits at the stern, motionless under the shattering sun, gazing out into, into vacancy. Whenever I raise my eyes, I see nothing else. Only this Kanak. He, he seems to be enjoying himself quite well. I was thinking so myself. The cannibal, the savage. He does not seem to suffer. What's going on in his brain? What does he dream of there? He looks as though he hates us. A dirty rat. Maybe, maybe he's waiting for us to die. Maybe he's waiting for the reward. At least he wouldn't starve on the way home. He could deliver us piece by piece. How does he do it, Doctor? Hasn't he any feeling? I've been wondering. It, it may be that his fibers are tougher. His nerves... But are... we've had water, and he hasn't. And yet, see his skin. It's moist and fresh. And his belly, fat as a football. Don't tell me this savage is thirsty. Is there any way he could steal our supplies? Certainly not. Suppose he has his own supplies, hidden. What? We'll see. Search the rat. Come on, we'll learn his secret. Here, look under the mat. Tear it apart. I'll push him aside. Anything there? No. Gentlemen, no. gentlemen. We were mistaken. He has nothing hidden. You're wrong about him, Doctor. He can. You say he has no understanding. There's one thing he can understand. Pain! Parrot, not so much! That's enough! There's come. Uh, that'll teach you. Not so chipper now, are you? Not so happy with your luck. That'll make you feel... Well, Parrot, you feel better now, don't you? Superior. Come back, my friends. Come back under the mats. The glare of the sun is not so bad there. Oh, idiots. What's the matter with our parrot now? Idiots. Why do we look and look? The schooner can't help us now. If we're becalmed, then they are too. Doctor, is that true? Yes. We must hope for a breeze first. Well, then why didn't you tell us we trust you? Why do you keep on playing out the farce? You are wise, Doctor. You are very wise. Put down the knife, Barrett. You know things we don't, and you keep them to yourself. All right, but be careful. If you think you'll use your wisdom to get the best of us, be careful, Doctor. Because I still have the knife. And so the days dragged by, the second, the third. And now it was the fourth day, and still there was no breeze. And still there was no ship. Oh, Doctor. Yes? Uh, what do you... what do you stare at? At him. At him, the native. The Kanak. Why? Look at him. And look at us. We are dying. Our powers are ebbing. And him? Naked. Wild. Brutish. He has yet to give the slightest sign of complaint or weakness. Doctor, is this a man or a fiend? A man. It is a man. A miracle. It is a man and a very poor and wretched example of a man. Why, you'll find no lower type anywhere. Uh, look at his cranial angle, the high ears, the heavy bones of his skull. Why, he, he's scarcely above an ape. Then what? He has a secret. A secret? We see him. Every move he makes, every minute. What chance has he for a secret? Absurd. Here are we three, children of the century, products of civilization, 
And here is this savage who belongs before the Stone Age. Is he to win this struggle? <laughs> Absurd. What kind of secret? I can't say. Perhaps some method of breathing. Some strange posture he uses to cheat the sensations of the body. Such things are known among primitive peoples. Known and jealously guarded. Like the properties of certain drugs. The uses of hypnotism. Who knows? We can know. We can find out. Would you ask him? Useless. He would not tell. Why should he? We scorn him. We give him no share with us. We abuse him. And so he falls back upon his own expedients. They are the means by which he has survived from the depth of time. By which he may yet survive when all our wisdom is dust. There are a number of ways of learning secrets. I know them all. It would be useless. How could he stand any torture you might invent? You saw how he behaved before? No, no, that's not the way. Oh, listen to my way. I'm tired of all this talk. You say he's a man. All right, then he has blood in his veins. At least we could drink. No, it would be too hot. It would be salt. Well, kill him then and throw him over the side. Let's be rid of the thing. We gain nothing. Then what do you want? I want to beat him. That's what I want. To beat him at the game. For our own sakes, for our racial pride, we must. To outlast him. To prove ourselves his masters. Watch him. Watch him closely, my friends. Watch. I'll watch all right, my good doctor. I'm not sleeping anymore. And leave you alone with that bottle. The bottle. The bottle. I've been meaning to discuss our rations with you. Have you? We're running very short. I'm afraid we must cut down again. And what are we cut to? Half a thimbleful. No. We must keep our wits. I say no. All right. Then we'll put it to a vote. You say no. I say yes. Fenero. Yes. Yes, anything, but give me mine now. Then it's half a thimble full for Monsieur Fenero. Oh. <laughs> Your share, Fenero. Uh, we... uh, more, more, I'll die. Give me more. No more today. You must, you must, Doctor. No more today. Look, a ship, a ship. Oh, at last. Where, where is it? I don't see any ship. It's a trick. Look, Fenero, he has the bottle. You dirty thief. <sighs> Look at him. You killed him with that oar. Uh, what about the bottle? <laughs> yes, there's some left. You caught him just in time. And you caught the bottle just in time. It seems I did. And there is no ship. There will be no ship. We are done. Because of you and your dirty promises that brought us here. Doctor... Liar! Fool! Don't come any closer. Unless you want this flask broken over your head. No. Oh, I wouldn't want that. Why, just think, Parrot. Why should you and I fight? We can see this trouble through and win, yet... This calm can't last forever. Besides, there will be only two of us to divide the water now. Yes, that's true, isn't it? Fenero kindly leaves us his share, an inheritance. All right. I'll take mine now. My share. Right now, if you please. Later, we'll see. So be it. Your share. Hmm. <clears throat> Many thanks. And now... Fenero share to me, please. As you say. And now, another, 
Another good doctor. Three. That's enough, Parrot. Uh, no, doctor. It's not enough. Now I'll take the rest. Uh, Parrot! Stop my arm! I'll uh, kill you if you don't uh, let go. <laughs> Thank you. You see, I have manners, haven't I? And I have wisdom, too, because I fooled a very wise man. I toast you, Doctor. The best man wins. That was a bright idea of yours. The best... <laughs> so... So the best man wins, eh, Bert? <laughs> you forgot I'm a doctor, didn't you? you? You forgot that a man cannot go without water for four days, then drink his fill and live through it, huh? <laughs> go on, Barrett. Gasp out your worthless life. <laughs> While I laugh. <laughs> the best man always wins, Barrett. The best man... <laughs> So, best man wins, yes, Doctor. You forgot my knife, didn't you? Forgot me lying at your feet. Gave me up for dead, didn't you? But now it is I, Fenneru, who will outlast the two of you. Yes, my good Doctor. The best man always wins. Fenneru, you fool. The water, it's running out. Hey. Long boat's back, sir. All right, send Marteau in. He's right here, sir. Bad luck, sir. The raft was here all the time, not ten miles away from us. Ah, that calm. Well, where are they, the passengers? Ah, oh, we're too late. They're all dead. All dead, huh? Yes, one stabbed to death, another skull crushed, the other fried by the sun. They're all dead. Well, then. All the better. Of course, there's nothing to feed. Yeah, but how are you going... Ah, hogsheads, my friend. The hogsheads in the afterhold. Fill them nicely with brine, and <laughs> there we are. Yeah, I don't understand. Oh, you're dull, Marto. Very dull. The gentleman's passage is all paid. Before we left Sydney, I contracted to bring back three escaped convicts. <laughs> I'll bring them back. Pickled. So if you'll go back, Marto, and bring them aboard for the trip, I'll be much obliged. Very well, sir. Oh, there's a fourth man on the raft, Captain. A Kanak. He's still alive. What do we do with him? A Kanak? <laughs> no word in my contract about any Kanak. Leave him there. He's only a savage. And so Dr. DuBose and Fenneru and the parrot went aboard for the long trip to their beloved Paris their bodies pitching and rolling gently in the huge vats of brine. On the raft, the fourth man raised his head slightly as a wind freshened from the west. He watched until the schooner turned, shaping away for Australia and disappeared over the rim of the horizon. Then he spread his sail of pandanus leaves and headed his raft eastward, back toward New Caledonia back toward home. Feeling somewhat dry after his exertion, the native plucked a hollow reed at random from the rushes on his raft. Slowly, lazily, he stretched himself at full length in his accustomed place at the stern, 
he thrusts the reed down deep into one of the bladders underneath the raft and slowly drank his fill of sweet water. He had a dozen such storage bladders remaining, built into the floats at intervals above the water line, quite enough to last him safely home again. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. The Fourth Man by John Russell was adapted for radio by Irving Ravitch, with Paul Fries as Dr. Dubose, Joe Kearns as Fenaru, and Nestor Piva as Parrot. Bill Johnstone narrated. The special musical score was conceived and conducted by Cy Feuer. Escape has been presented by the Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated station. <laughs> Be sure to be with us next Monday night when the Radio Theater returns to the air with Betty Davis and Glenn Ford starring in A Stolen Life. Remember, next Monday evening from 9 to 10 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, the Lux Radio Theater starts its 14th year over CBS. The play, A Stolen Life. The stars, Betty Davis and Glenn Ford. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. A creature, part of the darkness before God created the heavens and earth, has awakened. It had slumbered, hibernating from the light. Now it's hungry and wanting to feed. Bobby, a local kid, and the police chief have gone missing. Everyone in the small town of Standard, Illinois, is turning to former Chicago cop Rob Aletto to find them. But as he starts his search, more people disappear. Rob is quickly overwhelmed. The night itself seems to come alive, taking these people. Aletto must find out why and discover a way to stop it before the entire town slips into darkness. Into Darkness by Jason R. Davis Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar The greatly anticipated sequel to Inside the Mirrors Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com you are about to hear is fiction, science fiction. We make no guarantees, however, how long it will remain fiction. Exploring tomorrow. And now here is your guide to these adventures of the mind... The editor of Astounding Science Fiction Magazine, John Campbell, Jr. Let's consider the proposition that interplanetary spaceflight has become a commercial proposition. There are regular liners running between the planets. And the Martian Queen, we'll say, is such a liner. A spaceship making a short run orbit from Mars to Earth. Uh, this time she's carrying 150 passengers and a crew of 30 or so. She's made a long, uneventful trip from space... And now she's approaching the last leg of her voyage, the deceleration for landing. Your attention, please. Uh, throughout the trip, artificial gravity has been maintained by spin around the long axis of the ship. In three minutes, the gyros will begin to slow the spin. We have to stop the rotation around the axis of the ship in order to apply thrust along it. Uh, please get into your bunks and fasten your safety belts. At the appointed time, gyros cut in, slowing the spin on the ship. 
rotation had stopped, the skipper of the Martian Queen and his navigator were ready to begin the actual landing. How's that course, man? Dead on, Captain Daring. We're approaching Earth a little over 60 miles per second. <laughs> I need to land at this speed. How much time do we have? About 15 seconds. The rocket tubes are aligned properly with respect to Earth. The timer is set. Ready? Yeah, strapped in and ready. Keep her on automatic to the last 5,000 feet. I'll bring her down from there manually. Right, sir. There she goes. <laughs> Get engineering on the other car. We're out of control. We're dropping straight toward Earth. The Martian Queen had been heading towards White Sands Spaceport. And as a matter of course, the radar teams at White Sands had been alerted for the landing. They had the ship pinpointed in their screens, and when the Martian Queen stopped decelerating, they knew there was something wrong. The major in charge of Control Tower 1 put in a fast emergency call to the commanding officer of White Sands Spaceport. General Stanley speaking. What's that, Major? The Martian Queen. Where? Yes, I understand. All right, get all data you can on her. Now, keep the radar tracking as long as possible and try to compute an orbit. I want to know where she's going to hit. And get a tight beam communications line to that ship. I want to speak to Captain Deering personally. Yes, Major, I'll be right over. Sergeant, get my jeep out in front fast. We're going to control Tower 1. I'll be ready to gun it. This is a class AAA emergency. And, Major, have you made tight beam connections with the Martian Queen? Yes, sir. Good. Now I'll take the microphone. Hello, Captain Deering. This is General Stanley at White Sands. Can you hear me? This is Deering. I'm coming in fine, General. What the devil happened up there? Explosion in the engine room. Don't know what caused it. Four men dead and the rocket troops are gone. What about the main converter? Almost completely gone. Some other didn't blow into fragments when it went. There's plenty of heat radiation. The engine crew must have died almost instantly. Well, what about these secondary converters? Nothing left of them but molten metal and slag. You've got no way to slow down the ship or change its course? No way, whatever, General. Our only hope is that we don't hit Earth. If we are on a collision course, we're finished. I know. Let's hope you go on past Earth without hitting it. Now, we have a radar fix on you, but it isn't accurate at this distance. Now get your navigator busy. And we want your coordinates and velocity as close as you can figure them. Oh, keep this line open. I'll call you as soon as I can get more information. Right. I'll get Clement busy on those figures. Over. Over. Oh, oh, Major. Yes, sir. Keep that line open no matter what happens. As soon as Captain Deering gives you those figures, have them coded and put through the big computer. Try to get a closer radar fix and put that data through the computer, too. I want an orbit on the Martian Queen that's as close as skin. You got it? Yes, sir. Good. And keep this whole thing quiet. Nobody is to know that the Martian Queen is in trouble till I've notified the Secretary of Special Affairs in Washington. Meanwhile, I have to use your phone. Operator, this is Major General Stanley. I want to put in a person-to-person emergency call to the Secretary of Special Affairs, Washington, D.C. Call me back as soon as he's on the line. There are lives at stake. Hello, experimental station? General Stanley here. Now, let me talk to Colonel Asmore. I don't care what he's doing. Get him on the phone. Colonel Asmore, Stanley. What's the top acceleration of that new experimental job? That's right, the XV-19. Good. I want you to have it loaded, primed, and ready to go within ten minutes. Emergency? I'll say it's an emergency. I want you to move faster than you've ever moved before. I want the XV-19 rocket out on the launching pad and ready within ten minutes. Now, that's an order. And keep this under your hat. If a word of this leaks out or if that ship isn't ready to go on time, I'll see to it that you never wear those birds on your shoulder again. Is that clear? Good. Keep your line open for further orders. Sixty miles per second isn't terribly fast as far as celestial objects are concerned. But 60 miles per second is 216,000 miles per hour. And when the Martian Queen had had her accident, she was already close in to Earth. Something had to be done within the next 25 minutes. But what can be done in only 25 minutes? Captain, I just got word from First Officer Haggerty does trouble. Some of the passengers are getting space sick from being in free fall. They're wondering why the ship isn't decelerating. Just have to take it a while longer. Did you get those figures relayed down to General Stanley? Yes, they said to hold on and give us the data as soon as possible. But, but the passengers... I know, are... I know. Now, what did you want me to do? 
Tell them that the Martian Queen might be headed for the biggest, most spectacular crack-up in history? That'd be real smart, wouldn't it? Well, I didn't mean it that way, Skipper. I, I was... Make the radio phone. That's White Sands again. Deering here. Deering, this is Stanley. How's everything? The same as ever. No propulsion, no escape. How does our orbit look? We have your coordinates down to a hair. We know within a mile or two uh, where you'll hit. Then we will hit him. Well, that does it, doesn't it? I'm afraid so. If nothing happens between now and then, you're going to get a hot dunk in the ocean. I see. Uh, where will we hit? We'll give a tank a mile or so, you'll hit Long Island Sound, about ten miles south of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Well, we... You do what has to be done, General. You can depend on me for my end of it. I know I could. Well, I'll let you know how things work out. I'll be waiting. <laughs> The seconds tick by, and every second that passes brings the Martian Queen 60 miles closer to Earth. At that speed, it doesn't take long to move a few thousand miles. The Martian Queen was heading toward death at 3,600 miles a minute. Captain Daring, this is Stanley again. Colonel Arthmore just phoned. We're sending up the XV-19, a super-fast high-acceleration rocket. It's the only thing that can possibly reach you in time, and even so, it'll be a close thing. Meanwhile, I'm trying to get in touch with the Secretary of Spatial Affairs, but he's out of his office right now. I'll let you know when to expect the rocket. All right, General. We'll be ready. Over. Over. Chapman, I just came from the dining hall. Some of the passengers got out of their bikes and looked out the big viewport. And then they could see Earth and they could see we're falling toward it. But one of them started fighting with First Officer Haggerty. The thing has ended up in a riot. A crazy fool. She's no trying to be fighting. Can't the crew do anything? That travel is pretty rough. Now, give me that microphone. Your attention, please. This is Captain Deering. Now, please, your attention. There has been an accident. The drive engines of the ship have been disabled and we're in a free-fall orbit. However, there is no reason to become panicked. We are in contact with White Sands Spaceport, and we've been notified that everything is under control. Now, some of you have been worried by the sight of Earth through the viewport, but I assure you we are in no danger of striking Earth. I repeat... The Martian Queen absolutely will not strike Earth. I'm well aware that this gravity-less condition is uncomfortable to many of you, but please have patience. It will only last for a few more minutes. I suggest that all of you return to your cabins and strap yourselves in. If acceleration were to return suddenly, anyone not strapped down might be seriously hurt. Please return to your cabins. Thank you. Well, that'll help some. Blevin, you go down and talk to them. Give them the same sort of information I gave them. And, Blevin... Yes, sir? Isn't one of the passengers a minister? Hey. Oh, yes, sir. The uh, Reverend James Taylor, I think his name is. Uh, he was a missionary on Mars. Yeah, well, get him to help you. Sometimes people will listen to a clergyman when they won't pay attention to a space officer. Right, sir. I'll do what I can. Just a minute. That's Stanley. Yes, Deering here. Deering, the XV-19 is on the launching pad now, loaded and ready to go. I haven't been able to get hold of the Secretary of Spatial Affairs yet, but uh, there isn't time to wait. I just got the signal, Daring. The XP-19 has left the launching pad. It will be up to you to guide it into the Martian Queen. Good luck, Daring. Thanks. But you'll need the good luck more than I will. So, good luck and uh, goodbye. Okay, Blevin. Go down and give them a speech. <laughs> This is Major General Stanley at White Sands Spaceport. I have been trying to get the Secretary of Spatial Affairs person to person Washington, D.C. It has been 20 minutes now. Wait. He's on the line. All right. Oh, hello, Mr. Secretary. Hello, General. I got to my office as soon as I heard. I've read the teletype report that you sent to my office. Is the Martian Queen definitely going to land in Long Island Sound? If it isn't stopped, yes. Well, is there any way at all of getting the drive going again? No, sir. Captain Deering stated flatly that the main converter and the secondaries are absolutely and completely ruined. It would take weeks to repair them. We only have minutes. Then we'll have to send up a rescue ship. That's impossible, sir. A rescue ship would never make it in time. You would have to accelerate to take off, decelerate to match the Martian Queen's velocity, and then accelerate to keep from hitting Earth along with the Queen. All in all, it would take more than an hour using every bit of acceleration a human being could stand. There's absolutely no way we can save them. None whatever, sir. 
There just isn't time. Well, just lucky this time, I suppose. Lucky? What do you mean? Well, it could have been worse. What if it landed in a populated area like New York City instead of Long Island Sound? You don't understand, Mr. Secretary. It isn't the Long Island Sound we have to worry about. It's the spaceship sound. What do you mean? Uh, just what I said. It doesn't matter whether the Martian Queen hits Long Island Sound or New York City itself. The results will be almost the same. It's the sound waves, the noise that will do the damage. I don't quite understand. You know what happens when a supersonic jet plane flies too low over a city, don't you? At 1,500 miles an hour, the shock wave from a jet plane can break windows from miles around. What do you think will happen when that spaceship comes in at 216,000 miles an hour? It will flatten every structure within a 50-mile radius. If that ship hits Long Island Sound, New York City will be toppling in ruins before it ever arrives. From Newark, New Jersey to Hartford, Connecticut, that shock wave will knock over everything standing. Can we evacuate the area? In a few minutes? Well, hardly. What do you suggest, General? There's only one thing we can possibly do. Send up a rocket with an atomic bomb in it and blow that ship into gas before it hits. Are you crazy, General? Blow up 180 innocent people? I can't permit that. And it's murder. Murder? Is it murder to kill people who are already doomed? Is it murder to save the lives of 20 million people? There must be another way. General, I order you to send up a rescue ship immediately. Listen, you blockhead. Do you understand that it is impossible to send up a rescue ship? Do you understand that I can't pull miracles out of a hat? We could no more get a rescue ship up there in time than we could catch the Martian Queen with our bare hands. You can't talk to me that way, General. I'm sorry. I'm simply trying to get you to understand there's only one way out. Those people in that spaceship are going to die, no matter what we do. It would be better if they died without taking a few million more people with them. There must be some other way. Do you have any suggestions? Well, I... Well, no, Exactly, but... there isn't any other way. Now, do I have your permission to send up that bomb? No. We've got to think of something else. <laughs> I just looked at the clock, Mr. Secretary. It's too late to do anything at all now. Even if you ordered it, a, a rocket bomb leaving this instant would be too late. General, you have to do something. All those oh, people... Oh, don't worry, Mr. Secretary. The Martian Queen won't hit the Earth. There won't be any crash. I sent up an XV-19 rocket under robot control several minutes ago. It was loaded with a thermonuclear warhead. I would have liked to have had your permission, but there simply was no time. You've already blown it up? That's right. I did it with Captain Deering's cooperation, of course. He knew it was the only way to prevent the destruction of 20 million people. So he guided the missile into his own ship. The Martian Queen was vaporized over a minute ago. I presume you know what this means, General? I know what it means. I'll have to be court-martialed because most people won't understand why I did it any more than you did. Even if I get out of it with a whole skin, I lose everything I've ever worked for. But that's a small matter compared with the satisfaction of knowing that I saved the lives of 20 million human beings. Maybe those people will understand why Captain Deering and I did what we did. And they're the ones who count. As time goes by, things do change, but the fundamental things apply. And the most fundamental of all, really, is you can't walk out on a problem and just let it take care of itself. By the time it gets taken care of, it's ready to take care of you, but good. Join us each Wednesday and Friday night for a fascinating adventure... In Exploring Tomorrow. Script was by Paul Anderson. Produced and directed by Sanford Marshall here in New York. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? 
That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer, all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. This is Five After the Hour by Les Weinrot. Permit us to lure you with the theme. Allow us to assuage you with the melody, for this is the opening of Five After the Hour. Music for this series is the original composition of Sal Stocko. And the orchestra is under the direction of Caesar Petrillo. Good evening. Tonight we concern ourselves with a blight upon the fair American scene. We view from all angles... An American fascist, a rabble-rouser, a hate-monger. And since even an analytic piece must have a title, we quote Hazlitt, who said, Prejudice is the child of ignorance. And call our offering, Child of Ignorance. Since this is an American child, let us bring it into the world with music typical of America. Notice that the music is gay and free. Perceive that the light motif is tolerant and filled with good nature. But this American child is a child of ignorance. He will grow up into a monster. The child will grow into a man who will spew hate and prejudice. He will become a weed in the lush garden of the United States. A blight on all good things. A malignant growth on the tolerance that is America. There he is. The child of ignorance. That is his voice. Remember it. For it is the voice of destruction. It is the cry of viciousness. It is the battle bray of the American fascist. And I say to you, Americans, don't sit still for this sort of thing. Fight fire with fire. Burn if you have to. Destroy if you have to. Kill if you have to. There Is are he speaking of an enemy of the United, United States? States? Who are Do these mealy mouthings concern well, themselves with a foe that threatens us with invasion? With such menaces. We know what to do with these babies. We've got plenty of lampposts in these United States. Enough lampposts to string each of these dissatisfied Americans to a lamppost apiece. That's the cure for them. And this doctor is one American. One real, honest-to-God, red-blooded American who's got enough intestinal fortitude to prescribe for them. There you have it. Freedom of speech. Sure, we've got freedom of speech. And the child of ignorance uses it. Uses it to sow the seeds of discontent, of suspicion, of greed and avarice and plunder. 
Lay into the minority. Take it out on the little guys. And if anyone dares raise his voice in protest, shout him down. And let Shout him down by accusing him of being un-American. That's the ticket. Wrap the red, white, and blue about yourself, child of ignorance, and show the wise guys up. We're coming. I'm going to take them for a ride. A nice, long, one-way ride. How can such a monster grow to manhood in these United States? How can he thrive and flourish? How can he have arrived at his present poisonous state? You rang? I did. Prepare the laboratory, please. Lay out the instruments for dissection. Scalpels, probes, etc. And select various historical cases for comparison. At once, sir. Oh, yes, and... uh, Invite every American to attend. I'll take care of everything. This sounds important. May I ask who the subject is to be? Subject? Uh, make out a card. It should read, A Clinical Dissection of the Child of Ignorance. <laughs> The poisonous state of the subject's body suggests that his present condition had its origin in early childhood. I had to do it. I had to, I tell you. But why did you have to? Who forced you, darling? Did someone make you do it? I can't tell you, Mom. I can't tell you. He'd hurt me. Something terrible. I can't. The poison began to work early. In the subject... And all other children, he made the victims of his cruelty. Now, mind you, evidence points out that he was not brave in his persecution. Always he was able to convince someone else to do the part of his dirty work that requires physical courage. This manifested itself, too, at an early age. You guys do what I tell you, see? Exactly what I tell you, and we'll take over the whole neighborhood. But first, you got to swear a blood oath. You gotta swear that no matter what happens, you'll stick together. And to me. Notice that the blood oath was of prime importance. This is the medieval abracadabra that has surrounded his entire life. In manhood, it will manifest itself in various phases of modern witchcraft designed to captivate the masses of people. But doesn't our school system serve for anything at all? Can't the infection be checked early? A fair question. The school record, please. School record of an ignorant child. Attended classes regularly through first six grades. Had a tendency to stir up trouble and make one of his classmates a scapegoat. Marked tendency to argue. Constantly resented authority of any kind, unless authority was vested in himself. Organized pupils into gang which levied tribute from shopkeepers and smaller children before and after school. Marked delinquency in seventh and eighth grades. Showed pronounced interest in civics, political science, and history. When asked why he liked these subjects, the ignorant child replied, I like them because, if you know them, you can push other people around. This remark is the keynote to the power complex inherent in the subject. From childhood, he wished to inflict his will upon the wills of others. Conclude his school record now, if you please. Subject left school without finishing the eighth grade. Local police were summoned when he injured teacher with a heavy book. Case was dismissed because of his eloquent plea of self-defense. Later evidence showed that the attack upon the teacher was malicious and premeditated. Now let us follow this child into the world, the world which he wishes to change into his own design. He secured employment at, let me see, 14. Who's the new punk? He's a kid the boss picked up. Name's Iggy. Iggy? Yeah. Pretty sharp, too. Boss has got him spotting cars. Catches on fast. Knows what's good and what's hot. Boss says he'll make a good finger man when he gets a little older. He began as a spotter for a gang which specialized in stealing and stripping cars. When one of the gang of young hoodlums challenged him to a knife fight, he disappeared from the gang precipitately. 
Again, this shows that he was afraid of physical violence where his own person was in danger. Next, we find him engaged in contact with the people of the Middle West. He went from town to town. Now, folks, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm here to bring a little sunlight into the lives of each and every one of you. Like the man said about his mother-in-law, if the old battle axe would smile, she'd crack her face. <laughs> well, folks, what is life but a little smile, a little give and take, a little sunshine spread around in the lives of every one of us? Now, that's why I'm here. Now, the great company I represent has asked me to come down here and offer to each and every he one He prospered in his trade for a while. He learned the cruelties and the avarices that are inherent in the people, and he played upon them. He was a great talker, loved to make speeches on any subject, and would have become a great pitchman indeed, but uh, there was the matter of being some $85 derelict in his accounts, so he went on to greener fields. <laughs> So it is with great pleasure that I have the privilege of introducing the inventor of Torn News Wonder Cure, the great healer and doctor himself. <laughs> My good, good friends. It was with great reluctance that I came to your fair community. As I drove through the approaches to your town and saw the beautiful shade trees, and the grass plots of your lovely backyards. I said to myself, Doctor, this is no place for you. This is a place of health and happiness. These people have no need for you. And then, then I saw a small child, a small child crippled with a dread disease. And I knew that unhappiness had visited even your fair community. And I knew that I would be welcome. I knew that I would be needed. My friends, life has been good indeed to this humble man. Of monies and friends and good health, I have enough to be triply blessed. But how can a man be content to count his blessings unless he is ready to share them with his fellows? How can a man face his maker at eventide unless he is able to say, Today, I have served my fellow man. That, my friends, is why I have come to your community. To share the blessings that have been given me with you. The formula for Tornu's Wonder Cure is a simple one. It is compounded of pure chemicals and great faith. It is the ultimate combination of great science and man's belief in his God. The science came to me through years of study. The faith through years of suffering. That is why, my friends, I have come to you. Shortly, representatives of this wonder-working cure will pass among you. In memory of that child that drew me to you, and of the millions of sick and ill, I have declared a special offering of this cure tonight for one dollar per bottle. One dollar per bottle. This ignorant child, who had grown into an ignorant, albeit cunning and deceitful adult, thrived and prospered with his wonder cure. But the monies that poured in for the compound of spring water and sassafras was not enough. No, oh, he craved for power. His very being demanded the adulation, the complete prostration of the populace. A corporal had become an emperor, a beggar, had become a king. There must be an angle. There's got to be an angle. A gimmick. Somewhere. 
There must be a way I can get to the top and push these dopes around. And as so often is the case, a woman provided the way. There had been many women in his life, and then there was this particular woman. She was a good woman, an honest woman, a nice woman. And she fell in love with this man and was robbed of her reason, as love sometimes robs a woman of reason. Darling, do you... Do you have another appointment tonight? Darling, do you have another appointment tonight? Yes, I have an appointment tonight. And any other night I feel like it. Oh, here's I see. Now we'll have some fun. Icky, baby, come to Mama. Hey, folks, now come on. Let's get the old party pepped up. What do you say? Come on. That was a historic night in the life of the ignorant child. A woman burst into the place where the party was in progress and screamed that a man had attacked her daughter. The crowd was indeterminate for a moment, and then his voice filled the room. Wait! Wait! Are you going to stand there like dumb animals while the fair womanhood of America is desecrated? No! 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 If this land has no law to deal with such swine, we'll take the law into our own hands. I say, let's find them and string them to a tree. The mob, led by the ignorant child, didn't stop to inquire into the man's innocence or guilt. The mob didn't stop. Mobs never do. There was a scuffle, and the man was lynched. And the ignorant child went home filled with a wild excitement. The incident itself was unimportant. He had tasted power. He had discovered himself. My good, good friends, I consider the post for which I am campaigning worthy of the best that is in a man. I would rather be alderman of this ward than president of the United States. Why? Because my home is here. Because my home is in the best ward in the world. The best. If it were not for certain elements who dare to claim the benefits of this ward and at the same time turn their noses up at honest old Poor men. That's why I want to represent this ward in the city council. So I can join you in driving this element out of our ward. Out of our city. Out of our state. I wish I could lead you in battle against this element. I wish I could hurl a first stone through their windows. But I can't. I can't because I'm a good American, a law-abiding American. But I can, and you can. We can lick them with a ballot, lick them and drive them out with our votes, and we will! boy sent me over to talk to you, Alderman. <laughs> I'm always ready to talk to the people. I stand you ever for... You can save it. that. I've heard it before. Can we talk net? Net. Shoot. Where do you really stand? We know you're flannel-mouthing for votes, but what do you really want? What's your price? And can we do business? Mm hmm. We can do business. Well, he's okay. A little nuts, but that's good. Wants to be a big shot got a Napoleon complex. 
but he'll go along. Will he stay in line? Don't worry about that. We'll see that he doesn't get out of line. He'll stay hitched. <laughs> And so, I should like to conclude by saying that I prize the high office I am contesting for more than anything else in the world. Yes, more than wealth and fame and prizes beyond compare. Because in this office, I can serve. In this office, I can protect the citizens of this state from the infamy of traitors in our midst. In this office, I stand guard against the hideous, squalling minorities who threaten our government. And in this office, I can deal with them. This is no time for namby-pambies. This is no time for idealists. This is a time for men of action. For men who are ready to fight and strike back and hurt and maim if necessary. Your humble servant is ready to do these things. In the protection of our state, our nation, America for Americans. And let all others beware. We know them. And we will track them down. And find them. And hunt them out like the coyotes they are. America for Americans! Bless you all. <laughs> And so, I warn you, look about you and take heed. This is a Christian nation. This is a white nation. Let those who do not conform go elsewhere, or we will drive them there. America or Americans! Bless you all. This clinical observation has come to its end. We have tried to prove Mr. Hazlitt's thesis, prejudice is the child of ignorance. In so doing, we've conjured up the life and times of an American fascist. This program should have frightened you more than a double horror feature at the movies. Such a monster can be spawned in these United States. Such a terror can bring the hate and viciousness of Hitlerism to these shores. The study of an ignorant child is closed. <laughs> Child of Ignorance was written, directed, and produced by Les Weinrot. Tom Moore was your narrator, and Charles Irving portrayed the Child of Ignorance. Original music was composed by Sal Stucco, and the orchestra was under the direction of Caesar Petrillo. Next week at this time, five after the hour, will again originate in the studios of WBBM Chicago, and will again be heard at this same time. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
The WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago 11. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Stay tuned now for adventure and excitement in the world of the future. Entertainment for the entire family produced right here in Kalamazoo. Join us now for a voyage into another dimension. A journey into a realm as infinite and limitless as time itself. Our destination, the farthest reaches of the imagination. WMUK Special Projects presents Future Tales. Pictures Don't Lie by Catherine McLean. I had been writing science stories for the Times for a few years before the whole business of the aliens came up. I got on to doing science because I wasn't a very good sports writer, and the Guild made it clear to the manager that I had enough seniority to make it tough to fire me. So when Masters went over to Time magazine, I was shoved into his spot. Now, being the man from the Times on any given story is quite a responsibility. It's not quite so inspiring as the London Times. You remember the butler announcing that there were several reporters and a gentleman from the Times? But we're supposed to look as if we didn't specialize in axe murders and picking winners at Jamaica. Of course, it pays off. You find scientists, atomic energy commissioners, even congressmen will open up to the Times men. And that's how I got on the inside of this whole business. I had met Joseph Nathan at a convention in Atlantic City, and when he invited me to look over his work, I accepted. I don't think there's anything classified in this work, Mr. Schwartz, as long as I don't actually supply you with the text of messages. I got a department clearance up to most confidential. Well, that should do it. You see, my job is radio decoder in the department here. Under the Pentagon, directly? No, the Department of Military Intelligence. Uh-huh. We use, uh directional pickup to tune in on foreign bands and record any scrambled or coded messages. I thought the code department was handled by the CIA. Well, I, I guess there is some duplication. Actually, though, I concentrate on the scrambled messages. Well, here, I can show you. I've, I've got a piece of tape here. This is a a typical scrambled broadcast. It's not military. It's a it's a commercial message. Oh? Uh, wait a minute here until I thread up the machine. Sure. Uh, you you know the basic principles. You you take a straight voice message, run it through on an electronic scramble circuit, and it may come out something like this. <laughs> now my job is to pick a thing like that out of the air. Analyze the patterns and wire an unscrambler. I've got this particular pattern set up on the machine. Tanker 734, capacity code 7. ETA at Galveston 30. You see? Mm-hmm. Now, that was just a commercial message. I do the same things with military intelligence. Is it something like old-fashioned cryptology? 
Well, yes, except that there's a small complication. You need a, a degree in advanced electronics for this. A waveform math with a, a touch of quantum physics. I suppose it's quite challenging, then, every time you pick up a new signal. Well, in a way. Actually, they do the same work in every country these days. Everybody knows it's just a matter of time before any scrambled pattern is broken. It's pretty routine. Mm -hmm. uh, ever pick up anything exciting? Well, actually, most of the messages when I unscramble them are still in prearranged code, and I have to turn them over to cryptology. But there is something interesting here. Uh, listen to this piece of tape. I don't hear anything. Well, that was it. Oh? Uh, now, listen. Uh, there, there's another one coming up. That's it. Well, I get that on my car radio. Static. Yes, but that's from the stars. Oh, you mean radio interference. That's right. Now, now I think you wrote about the work at Bell Telephone and RCA Labs about radio telescopes mapping the star positions by static. You're interested in that. Well, not exactly. Uh, they've never been able to figure out why the static on these particular bands comes in such jagged bursts. It just doesn't seem natural. You have any ideas? Oh, I, I don't know. I, I've been kicking around the notion that it's not a natural phenomenon. I've been trying to discard it, sort of like playing chess against yourself on the train in the morning. Well, that's about all there is. That's all it was then. Joe Nathan swindling a few hours of government time to ride a hobby horse of his. I wrote it up for the Sunday magazine section. It got squeezed out by an article by a famous actress on the ten leading roles I disliked the most. So I forgot about it, went back to announcing a miracle drug per week and conflicting theories of psychoanalysis. Ha ha. I don't know what I'd do without them. They're always good for a piece. I was at the office late one night. I didn't have any work, but I just didn't feel like going home and putting the kids to bed. Yeah? Uh, Mr. Schwartz. That's right. This is Joseph Link. You remember? Yeah, sure. How are you? Mr. Schwartz, can you come out to my lab? I'd like to show you something. Well, maybe we can make an appointment. No, I mean tonight. Oh, what is it? I think I've found something that you might be interested in. Yes? Do you know those static bursts I recorded? The ones that came from the stars? That's right. I've decoded them. When you write science for the times, you don't often go dashing off on the trail of scoops as in TV versions of newspaper life. But it was about a quarter to twelve as I drove out along the highway, listening to the radio to keep from piling up the car against a tree. The radio keeps me awake. Nathan was waiting for me at the gate. He had quite an argument to get me in past the MPs. We were challenged four times before we got to his lab. I'm glad you came, Mr. Schwartz. Oh, it's a nice night for a drive. Uh, I know, I know. Uh, but, uh, frankly, I, I wanted to ask you what I should do. Uh, you see, I requisitioned the supplies without authorization. And I don't know how to explain it to my division chief. Well, I, I mean, it isn't as if I, I took any of the equipment home. It's all right here, but uh, I've got to tell somebody. I, I just thought you might have some experience in, in how to handle a thing like this. Like what? Well, you remember that static recording I played you? Now, here, I, I've got it set up. Yes, I remember it vividly. Now, Mr. Nathan, it's very late. Now, you see, uh, there's an old intelligence trick. A speeding up a recording till it sounds just like that. Now, a short squawk of static and then broadcasting it. Undergrounds used that when they, when they didn't want their transmitters located by triangulation. Now, when you receive the broadcast, you slow it down and get your message. Now, wait a minute. You mean that you've decoded those static bursts from the stars? <laughs> well, no, not, not exactly. I'm, I mean, 
They're not in code. You think there's somebody out there broadcasting at us? Well, no, it's not exactly that either. Now, you see, if a star has inhabited planets and there was any broadcasting between them, they'd send it on a tight beam to save power. Uh -huh. Naturally, they, they would compress each message into a short half-second or half-length package and send it a few hundred times in one long blast to make sure it was picked up during the instant the beam swings across the target. You see? Uh, well, yeah, I, I suppose so. Is that what those static squawks were? I think so. I've got them analyzed up to a point, and they can't possibly be random. Oh? Yeah, I, I recorded a couple of screeches from Sagittarius section, and I concentrated the work on them. It's taken me a couple of months to find the synchronizing signals and set the scanners close enough to the right time to get an even pattern, but I'm getting close to it now. You mean you've actually picked up messages from some form of alien life out there in the stars? Yes. And this raises a tremendous problem. How am I going to explain to the division chief why I made all those unauthorized parts requisitions? I convinced Mr. Nathan that the supervisor was likely to overlook about $300 worth of electronic gear. I'm presented with the fact that Nathan had discovered life in other star systems and was close to deciphering some of their messages. The department put him on full time, gave him an assistant. They made me swear to sit on this story by promising to give me the first break on it when it was finally released. So I kept checking with Nathan as he worked. I don't think it's a voice message. What is it? A racing wire? Are we catching some late scratches from some track at the edge of the galaxy? Well, I don't think so. It's a... TV signal. Oh? Well, there's a definite scanning pattern. I, I can separate out the locking poles for a picture. Yeah. Now, the only problem is I've no way of assigning colors to the various bands. What makes you think it's color? Oh, it, it seems as if it's got to be. Now, uh, look at these waveform analyses. Uh, with a band spread that wide, well, it rather indicates a color transmission, don't you think? Well, sure. Why not? Let me know when you get all in the family. And then, of course, he did. Not all of the family, but the equivalent of it. He called me about four months later. He had a monitor screen set up on a bare chassis with a wide band videotape machine recording everything that came in. Uh, here. Uh, wait till I adjust the set here. Now, uh, there. You, you see this picture? Looks like a scotch plaid. Well, we finally assigned the colors so that they seem to give a rational picture. Now, wait a minute. I'll, I'll clear it up. Yeah. There. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. There, there it is. What is that? That's the signal from the stars. It's a picture. Some kind of distorted broadcast. That's what I've said. It's a broadcast. And it's coming from somewhere out past Sagittarius. Uh, do you want to uh, hear the audio signals? That's their language? That's right. We're sure about that. The colors were assigned arbitrarily, of course. But you see that, see that, see that figure there? The tall one? With the green skin? Yes, yes. Now that skin may be, may be blue or, or pink or, or gray or, or anything. We, we don't know what their color response is. The only thing we're sure about is the various shadings of intensity and the audio channel. What is it? What's it all about? Well, we haven't decoded the language yet. There's a, a team from Harvard working on that. Uh, we record everything that comes in, but I, I think it's a lending library. A what? It's all fiction. It's plays. And there are, there are dozens of them, all at the same time. I think they broadcast them continuously. And anybody who wants a particular play can tune it in. With the short burst method of transmission, you, you've got plenty of room in the spectrum. A lending library? Of course. And as soon as we break the language barrier, we'll know for sure. Oh, oh by the way, I, I thought you might be interested. I've, 
I've sent them back a message. When are you going to release this? When can I use it? Well, I don't know. In the civil service, you know, you don't ask questions. You just... Now, look, I'm a newspaper man. This is the hottest well, story. Well, I thought you were from the Times. I know, I know, but it's still a newspaper. What's the message you sent them? How did you do it? Well, I, I took a print of a film. Yeah? Well, as a matter of fact, it was Conky Ellis' uh, Dance of the Hours from the Disney film. You, you know, with the dancing hippopotamus and crocodile. I think I remember it. Well, I scanned it with the same combinations and sent it back along the same line we're receiving from. Uh, just testing. Uh-huh. What do you think they'll make of dancing hippopotamuses and crocodiles out past Sagittarius? Oh, I, I did record a prologue and I explained what it was. I thought it would please their library to get a new record in. Look, Mr. Nathan, please, will you find out when they'll release this? Well, as, as a matter of fact, I do have an idea that the project supervisor said there'd be a big news when we get an answer back. When? When? Oh, uh, at the rate of transmission, um, only about three or four years. That's when it was, three or four years. I forgot about Nathan for most of the interim. It was one of the few stories in which nothing leaked. I have a feeling if the Pentagon realized how much I knew about it, I never would have gotten out of the laboratory. And so this story seems a lot more direct than it actually was. An awful lot happened in the four years before Nathan called me again, landing on the moon for one. But when he did call me, he had big news. Here, and now watch this. Watch. Is that the recording of the message you sent down? I've seen that before. No, it isn't. That's a message we've received. They're playing it back to us. Now, wait, wait. You'll see. Now, look. You see? There's an auditorium. They've been showing our message on the screen. Now, look. Look at them. What are they doing? Waving their hands in circles. Well, that might be applause. We, we can't tell. But uh, that isn't the most important thing. Now, now, watch. Now, their camera, or whatever they use, pans up from the audience. Look at that wall. Hey, it looks like a ship's hold. Yes, it is. It's a spaceship. That accounts for the intensity of the broadcast. We've picked up an alien spaceship, and they've gotten our message. They're approaching our solar system, and we'll be able to contact them. Joe, you know, I, I just don't care anymore. You've strung me along with this thing for five years, and it's no use to me. Absolutely oh, no use. Wh why didn't I tell you? Why, the Department of Defense is releasing the story to the press. You have it today, and there'll be a general release tomorrow. <laughs> And, of course, you remember the story. We had it first, and any paper or TV broadcast that picked it up before the general release had to carry my byline in the Times copyright. I think it was the most important single newspaper beat that I've ever heard of. And, of course, I did very well because of it. It was page one in the upper right-hand corner of the Times for eight days running. And then the arrangements were made to cover the landing of the alien ship. The White House press secretary handled the whole thing. There'd be one pool man on the inside in direct contact with Nathan, the linguist teams, and the brass. Naturally, I got the pool assignment. There wasn't any question of it, really. But the rest of the boys were in on the releases, briefings, and press conferences. On arrival day, we all drove out to the apron of White Sands Rocket Base. The concrete is graded to stand the thrust of those three-stage giants that make the satellite moon runs. The communications equipment was set up in the old red control block house. First, they threw Nathan to the wolves in a press conference. The TV boys were down on their knees in the first row, and the rest of us in the base movie theater. Nathan was up on stage. Al Sullivan from the news let it off. Mr. Nathan, what do you think of the aliens? Are they friendly? Do they look human? Uh, very human. Exactly where will the alien ship land? Well, uh, that isn't exactly my field. But uh, when you get out to the port, you'll see the strip. It's uh, like a tic-tac-toe diagram. 
The release describes the precautions that have been taken, except for the grass strip along the runway. The light area has been remodeled. Do you know anything about their home planet? Uh, no, uh, nothing directly. You think they're dangerous, then? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. You realize, Mr. Nathan, that the 8th Atomic Artillery Battalion has been drawn up five miles north of the port, prepared for action. Well, no, that's, uh, that's not my department. I don't know what precautions the military has taken. But you think they're friendly. Well, those I know are. I, I've been in contact with their radio operator of the ship. And Bud says, I call him Bud, uh, that he's uh, worked up quite a thirst on this trip. <laughs> of course, we don't know what he drinks. We have no common chemical terminology. Uh, we've arranged for you to see some of the recorded broadcasts that we have made. Uh, when you watch them, I'd, I'd like you to realize that these are plays, all fictional. We haven't dubbed in a translation of the soundtracks, although since these were recorded, we've developed an automatic translator. Well, you'll, you'll see that later. Uh, all right. I, I think we're ready for the showing. If someone will please dim the house lights. Of course, I'd seen the films before, but I stayed at the back of the hall to watch them again. The almost human forms, half dancing, the colors bright but strange. The sound was a flowing language with many shifts of pitch, and there was that strange, odd motion, not slow, but somehow drifting. It had been bothering me for some time in the films. There was something in the way they walked. They were good actors. Even without knowing what was happening, you were interested. You could tell the hero from the villain sometimes, and you rooted for him. Finally, I went out to the lobby, and I found Nathan pacing up and down. Oh, what's on now? That recording that they returned to the Ponchielli. Oh, it's funny, you know, that. They are crazy about Punkielli and Mozart, and they can't stand Gershwin. Strange. Joe, there's something wrong with the films. What do you mean? There's something wrong with the whole thing. It's a hunch. There's something about the way they move. That, that bothers me, too. When I turn the tape faster, they're all rushing, and you begin to wonder why their clothes don't stream out behind them, why the doors won't close quickly behind them. Why things fall so fast? Well, we don't have to worry about it. We'll see them in about two hours when they land. He seemed a little too cheerful. Joe Nathan wasn't like that. He was usually too serious, took things literally but he seemed to be trying to convince himself that nothing could go wrong. It was as if he smelled a rat, but held his nose and went right ahead. At minus 30 minutes, we all took our places in the blockhouse. They had a monitor set up with the automatic translator hooked up on the audio shaft. The alien operator looked as if he were talking, but the lip movement didn't quite match, like a bad foreign film with English dubbing. Uh, there he is. He's broadcasting. Uh, uh, throw on the translator unit. We've decelerated enough to enter the atmosphere. We'll be landing in three time periods. Hey, Joe, what is it? A murky-looking planet you live on. What does he mean by that? He's kidding. I've been talking with him for a few weeks. He's got a sense of humor. What does he mean, murky? It can't be raining over much territory on Earth. It rained here this morning, but it's cleared up now. Oh, there he is again. Uh, see the way he holds his mouth in an O? Uh, that's their laugh. Uh, there. There, you can see his view screen behind him. He must be just entering the atmosphere. Oh, the, there goes the green light again. What's that? Oh, we're not getting this broadcast direct. That light means they've sent a concentrated squawk broadcast. We record it, slow it down, and then play it back here. Uh, just a minute and we'll get what he said. Ah, here he comes. Hey, Joe, it's dark. Your atmosphere is thick, really thick. You didn't tell me about that. Approaching ground level. I didn't hear any rocket jets. We should hear a landing blast, shouldn't we? Well, we don't know. We don't know. Now, oh, another message in. We've landed. We're down. 
Why, they can't be. They can't be. There's nothing out there. Oh, here he is again. Listen, Joe, we're down. We've landed, but our detection field shows no buildings near. Nothing. The atmosphere registers thick as glue. There's tremendous gas pressure. Our hull won't take it too long. There's no light at all. You didn't describe it like this. What kind of a trick is this? We've got a directional fix on the broadcast now. Where is it? There, on the field. We're trying repair. We're adjusting the view screen to pick up the long waves to go through this murk. The engineer says there's something wrong with the steam jets. We're sending a help call to your nearest space base. Joe, get us out of here. But where are they? Where are they? There's nothing out there. Nothing. Uh, they'll have to triangulate the next broadcast again. Joe, you've got to send a rescue party somehow. Listen, we've got a viewing screen rig now. We're in the middle of a half circle of, of cliffs. Around the horizon, there's a wide, muddy lake with swimming, pulpy things, attacking and eating each other on all sides. We're almost in the lake on the south edge. The mud can't hold the ship's weight and we're sinking. The tubes are mud clogged. When can you reach us? They're out there. They're out there on that airport, on the empty field. Where are you? We're sinking. Where are you? I was wrong. The squawk transmission, by speeding it up for better efficiency, I was wrong. What do you mean? They don't speed up their broadcasts. They live that fast. Over an hour of talk and action in one squawk? Nothing of any size could move that fast against inertia. Joe, get us out. We're sinking. We're sinking into the mud. The hull is buckling. Joe, get us out. You can't. How? Why, there isn't a, a lake or a river within hundreds of miles of here. The broadcast came from out there, from the concrete spaceport. Possibly at the edge of the runway, where the grass is growing. After all, it rained this morning. Do you think we could ever find them? Maybe. With a strong enough magnifying glass... WMUK Special Projects has presented Pictures Don't Lie, a story by Catherine McLean, adapted for radio by Ernest Kenor. John Phillips was heard as Schwartz, Mark Spink as Nathan, and Greg Moody as the alien pilot. Future Tense is produced and directed by Ellie Siegel. Next on Future Tense. We have a strange story to tell. A sweet, blood-curdling little tale that is really only two sentences long. The last man on earth sat alone in a room. There was a knock on the door. Think it over. Suppose you were the last man alive on earth. In the universe, for that matter. The last man sitting alone in a room, and suddenly there was a knock on the door. What knocked on the door? You wonder, don't you? Your mind, faced with the unknown, supplies something vaguely horrible. But it isn't horrible, really. You'll see. This is Gerard McLeod inviting you and your entire family to join us every Monday through Thursday at the same time for Future Tense. Be sure to listen. What makes someone kill? Not only innocent people, but sometimes the very people who loved and trusted them. What imagined wrongs could drive a deluded individual to seek revenge by taking another person's life? What lengths will people go to to get what they want? Murderous Minds, Volume 2, Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escape the Headlines is the latest offering in a series that takes you inside the life of killers who committed cold-blooded murder for a glimpse at events that drove them to kill. Each tale is sordid, twisted, and worthy of newspaper headlines. 
By weaving a tale in which dark fantasies turned reality, this book invites you to see life from a perspective few ever witness – that of the killer. Paired with an in-depth account of each case, it will be a nightmarish journey to the darkest reaches of the mind of these real-life murderers. Murderous Minds, Volume 2, written by Ryan Becker, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Gentlemen, your faithful friend with muscles ache and pain presents Gangbusters. Gangbusters, brought to you, the men and women of America, by the makers of Sloan's yeah, Liniment. With the cooperation of leading law enforcement oh, officials of the United States, the of the show. Gangbusters presents no. facts in the oh, relentless good. war of the police on the underworld. Okay. Okay. Authentic okay. case histories yeah. that show the never-ending activity of the police in their work of protecting yeah. our citizens. Really? America's crusade the against the crime. Now for our proxy interview between Colonel Schwarzkopf and Judge L.D. Miller of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Picture our setting as a special office turned over to gangbusters by Commissioner Louis J. Valentine of the New York City Police. Colonel Schwarzkopf. Judge Miller, I understand that Charleston and Rogers, the nickel and dime bandits, were hunted by the police of six states. Yes, Colonel Schwarzkopf. Actually, eight different police departments were after them within a period of 30 days. But why do you call these particular criminals the nickel and dime bandits? Well, Colonel, James Carlson, the brains of the combination, had a theory of crime different from any criminal in all my experience. I got a new slant on stick-ups that'll pay big dividends. I'm going to get me a smart partner that knows how to use a gift. Then we're going to go through the Mississippi Valley pulling little jobs, nickel and dime jobs. When we pulled enough of these nickel and dime jobs, we'll have just as much jack as if we'd stuck up a dozen big banks. On December 4th, 1939, following a term at Minnesota State Reformatory, Charlson drove up to a roadside tavern near Minneapolis. The owner was talking to a customer. Be right with you, mister. Anything else, sir? Oh, that'll be all, Bill. Charge it, will you? <laughs> with a fancy car like that, you want me to charge it? <laughs> no fancy right behind you, pal. Turn around. What? Look out, Bill. He's got a gun. A special kind of gun, mister, with a hair trigger. Come on, both of you. Back up into that hot dog joint before I turn this cannon loose on you. I want your dough. Oh, I got some change. Give it to me. Here you are. Now you. Open up that cash register. Here. Thirty-five bucks. It's all I got. I know it ain't. Scoop out that change and stick it in my pocket. Nickels and dimes, huh? I'd like to see you for five minutes without that gun. Here's a change. Thanks, white guy. Now, get out of here. Not so fast, you. Empty your pockets. Uh, pretty brave, aren't you, with a gun? Yeah, and it's liable to go off any minute. No sort of punk's gonna take my dough. I warned you, wise guy. Bill! You're not getting away from me. I'll show you. Give me a gun. You're all through, punk. Let go of me. Bill. You hurt? Let go of me. Yeah, I guess so. Pretty bad, I... You got all three of those bullets, but I got his gun. You're going to need a doctor. What do we do with this guy? Lock him in the washroom. Yeah, you make it all right? Yeah, sure. Now, I got the special gun, you rat. Yeah. Give me back my money. All right. Here you are. Now, come on, you're in the washroom. You'll never get me to jail. Inside, punk. Okay, white guy. I'll lock it and then phone the police. Better get an ambulance, Bill. You're bleeding bad. Hello. Hello, operator. Get me the police. Sit down, Bill. What's that? The washroom window. There. Up front. There he goes. He's in his car. Stop. Stop or I'll shoot. Oh, it's jammed. That guy's special pistol jammed and saved his own life. 
It is rare, Judge Miller, for the victim to turn on his assailant at gunpoint and disarm him. It is, Colonel. Fortunately, the wounds of the tavern owner were not serious. Johnson made a dash for Chicago, where he went into partnership with another criminal named Joe Rogers. Together, they stole a late model car and started south, blazing a trail of robberies from Illinois to Louisiana. On the night of December 17th in Blytheville, Arkansas, Charlson and Rogers committed an unusual robbery, showing a peculiar obsession. Blytheville, Arkansas, robbery. Two men broke into a house and stole a large collection of pistols, automatics, shotguns, and rifles. Seen escaping in blue or black Dodge sedan. Notify all gun dealers to be on lookout for unusual weapons of foreign make. A few days later, Colonel, Charlson and Rogers were in Minneapolis, waiting in a stolen new Buick sedan across the street from a small apartment house. (laughs) Boy, this is the life of Rogers. You said it, Charlson. Cops and newspapers screaming about us from here to New Orleans. (laughs) Nothing for us to do but sit back and take it easy. (laughs) I'd sure like a drink right now. So would I. Wish that baby ears would hurry up. Uh, It's only ten past eleven. I told her to sneak out a quarter past. She made up her mind to come with us? Hope so. You know me, Rogers. Wine, woman, and song. Yeah, I know. But when are we going to quit this small time stuff and go after something big? Like what? Banks. Forget it, Rogers. Knock over a bank and every cop in the States after you. Just think of the dough we could pick up in banks. Oh, we've been getting to places you pick us chicken feed. Nothing but nickels and dimes. There's nothing you can't buy with nickels and dimes, Rogers. If you got enough of them, sure, but we could. There's no but to it. It adds up, see? And the rap for little jobs is nothing like it is for a bank. But in one bank job, we... Listen, sap. Hey, take it easy, will you? Banks have guards, and the guards have guns and tear gas. They have balconies to ambush bank bandits. And they have burglar alarms to call the cops. Don't you see? We can get as much in a flock of gas stations as we could in a dozen banks. And no risk. Ah, uh, maybe you're right. The way I figure it... Hold it, Charles. Here comes your girlfriend. Oh. Hello, baby. Hello, Jim. Jim, glad to see you. You and me both. Get in the car. Okay. It's my pal, Joe Rogers. Oh, pleased to meet you. How are you? Oh, what's up? Where are we going? We're going south, kid. How'd you like to go with us? South? Oh, gee, I'd love to, but what about my folks? (laughs) Send them a postcard. Yeah. Just say, having a wonderful time. I wish you were here. (laughs) Hey, what are you guys going to do? We got special ideas. Swell clothes, good liquor, and plenty to keep us busy. What do you say? I say, what are we waiting for? Baby, you're going to be perfect. Let's go, Rogers. Where to? Back to New Orleans, where it's nice and warm. We're going to make some stops on the way. And where we stop, nobody's ever going to forget us. This will be a joy ride to remember. That was near midnight, Colonel, on December 21st, 1939. Three days later, Chief C.R. Bryan of the Chattanooga, Tennessee Police was sitting in his office when Police Captain Homer Edmondson walked in with a message in his hand. Morning, Captain. Good morning, Chief Bryan. This just came in on the teletype. Thought you'd like to look at it. Um, Sweetwater, huh? Yes, sir. Arrest two men wanted here for robbery of roadside cafe this morning, 3 a.m., one man about 20, weight 150, blue eyes, light hair. The other one, older, weight about 140, dark hair, slender. Both bandits wearing leather jackets. That's a pretty complete description, Chief. These bandits took $60 in currency, cigarettes, liquor, and a large amount of nickels and dimes. They're heavily armed. Large amount of nickels and dimes, that sounds familiar. You're right, Captain. This is the sixth report in the last few days that used those exact words. Yes, and each report was near Chattanooga. Have you broadcast this message to the patrol cars? Yes, sir. Right after it came in. Send it out again, Captain. This is the first good description we've had of those men. If they try anything here, I want every man on the force to be waiting for them. Right, Chief. Wait a second. Chief Barnes, being. System cops over quit, Chief. I've just been robbed. Who's this? Jack Parker. I got a filling station at Maiden Watkins. I just opened up ten minutes ago and two guys walked in and... Hold on a minute. Captain, there's been a holdup over at Maiden Watkins, a filling station. Send a patrol car over there right away. Right away, Chief. 
Go ahead, Mr. Parker. What happened? These two guys walked in, Chief. They both wore leather jackets. They had four guns between them, and they cleaned out the cash register. How much did they get? Seven bucks. Almost all small change. Nickels and dimes, huh? Well, I know it don't sound like much, Chief, but it's a lot to me. Mr. Parker, I don't care if it was seven cents or seven million dollars. If these bandits are the men I think they are, they're going to try to pull some more jobs like this here in Chattanooga, and we're going to get them. The next afternoon, Colonel... The woman manager of a small dry goods store in Chattanooga saw two men, apparently customers, walking into her store. May I help you, gentlemen? Yeah. Let me see some shirts. The best you got. And I want to see some socks and ties. Certainly. Right over here. What size shirt, sir? Fifteen collar, thirty-four sleeve. And I want size eleven socks. Here they are. Just take your pick. That's just what we're going to do, sister. Stick them up. <laughs> Hold up. Take it easy, sister. One peep out of you and I'll drill you. Please. Get down on the floor behind our counter. And don't move if you want to live. Yes, sir. Pretty, pretty fancy looking socks, pal. Get some for me. And the shirts you're getting. Silk. The most expensive I can find. Oh, please. Fast. Okay. Here's your look swirl. Green silk. You ready, pal? Yeah, let's go. Hey, sister, where's your cash register? There, in the back of the counter. But there's only a... I know, I know. There's only a little change. That's what they all say. How much, pal? Ten bucks and about five and change. Thanks for the service, lady. We be sure to tell our friends about you. And remember, sister, if you move off that floor before or out of this store, it'll be the last time you ever move. Exactly 44 minutes later, Colonel, in a Chattanooga liquor store on the other side of town... Uh, will that be all, gentlemen? Just the three bottles of whiskey? No, that ain't all, mister. Reach for the ceiling. Uh, what do you want? Don't shoot him, pal. The cops might hear you get. All right. Keep him covered. Okay? Uh, what are you going to do? I'm going to teach you not to be so nosy. Oh, oh. That'll teach you to ask me what I want. No, no, please. No. Please don't kick me again. Come on, pal. Let's get out of here. Get the dough. Okay. Take everything, even a small change. How much is it? Yeah, it's about 90 bucks here. Hey, here's something else, pal. A nice new gap for your collection. Say, not so bad. Different from any I got. Maybe I ought to try it out on this wise guy. No, no, please. Okay, please. mister, but just so you won't run after us, here's something more to remember us. But... Oh. That brutal holdup was the third the nickel and dime bandits committed in the heart of Chattanooga within 24 hours, Colonel. It redoubled the efforts of the police to catch Charleston and Rogers and resulted in a gun battle that Chattanooga will long remember. Law enforcement officers within a radius of 50 miles of Chattanooga cooperated. At a special meeting of police representatives at the office of Chief C.R. Bryant, all possible angles were discussed. Unfortunately, men, we have a complete description of these two bandits and definite identification clues. What are they, Chief Bryant? Well, first, Tussman, there's the nickel and dime angle. So anyone seen spending an unusual amount of silver is a definite suspect. Then there's the gun angle. The gun angle? It's this, Frazier. These men are crazy about guns. They take pride in them. Not just as weapons, but as items to collect. Ooh, so the bandits might just show off their guns sometime without staging a holdup, huh? Particularly if they've been drinking. That's still another clue, Chief Brian. The amount of liquor they consume, judging by the amount they've stolen. And the girl with them. The one that's been seen in their car. Now, we have her description. All right, Captain Edmondson. These are all valuable clues, men. And we have one other advantage. From what these bandits have said to their victims, they don't expect the police to go after them seriously. Just because the thefts have been relatively small, huh? Exactly. Hmm. That gives me an idea, Chief. What is it, Edmondson? Maybe we can get these bandits through a weakness in their own system. How, Captain? Let's give these clues to every reliable citizen in the vicinity of Chattanooga. Every small storekeeper. Then when the bandits do show up again, they'll be spotted immediately. Good yeah, 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 idea. Yeah. Well, then it's understood every available man is to stay on duty till these bandits are behind bars. I want them in custody before somebody gets killed. Within one hour after that meeting, Colonel, merchants, filling station employees, liquor store proprietors, business people all over Chattanooga were planning to cooperate with the police. Cooperate with police? Listen, I'm staying right here at the store. If those bandits come back this way, I'm going to be ready for them. If this is those nickel and dime crooks come anywhere near me, I'm going to call the police. I'll know them if I ever see them again. I'll be glad to cooperate. I've got a score to settle with those rats. And I'd like to see them both behind bars. If they ever come into my place, I'll... Nickels and dimes, eh? I get it. If those buzzards stick their noses in my place, I'll be waiting for them. You can count on me. 
That night, Colonel, December 26, 1939, at the Rock Castle Roadhouse, ten miles west of Chattanooga, the cashier, Bill Rafer, was standing behind his counter. Hey, you, cashier. Yes, sir. I want a bottle of whiskey. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. We're not allowed to sell liquor in bottles, except the guests of Rock Castle. I'm a guest here. Me and my pal are in one of the cabins right next door. Oh, I'm begging your pardon. Sure. Uh, here you are. That'll be uh, 165, please. You'll have to take it and change. Change? Fistful, buddy. Here. 25, 50, dollar, 10, 20, 30, 55, 65. Right. Thank you, sir. Your bet is right. Say, what are you staring at? Oh, why, I... See anything wrong with me? No, I I was just thinking what a good-looking green silk shirt you have on. Oh, that, yeah. Yeah, it is good-looking. Everything I got's good-looking. Look at this. Hey, hey, what? Ah, don't be scared. I ain't gonna use it on you. Boy, that's some pistol. (laughs) Bet your life it is. Special automatic. Only one like it in the country. Yes, sir. Well, is there anything else you want? Yeah, yeah, sure. I almost forgot. Give me, uh, give me uh, some of those box lunches you got, huh? How many? Let's see now. Uh, three, yes, three. Here they are. Do you want me to carry them for you? Yeah, that's right. I'm getting a little rocky. Hey, Joe, take over, will you? Okay. I'll be right back. Let's go, sir. So which cabin is it? Second one on the left. Is this the cabin? Yeah, yeah, I'll look. Uh... Hey, open up. Come on, come on, come on, open up. It's me. Come on. Pipe down, will you? Come on, let me in. Where's me? I reckon I'll be getting along, mister. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. See you later, mister. Good night. Yeah, I'll see you later. Operator, operator, get me the police. Chief, listen, this is Bill Raper out at Rock Castle. Yes, Bill? Those two nickel and dime crooks you're looking for, they're here. How do you know? I'm positive, Chief. Every single clue you give me. The, the nickels and dimes, the, the guns, the liquor, everything checks. Did you notice a car? Yes, sir. It's a big, black, new 1940 Buick. Where are they? In a cabin right next door. How many? Three of them, sir. Two men and a girl. That's what I call fine cooperation, Bill. Sit tight and don't say a word to anyone. Mm-hmm. I'll send an emergency squad out there right away. Fifteen minutes later, Colonel, Captain Homer Edmondson with a group of picked men from the Chattanooga Police Force, including Detective Shipley and Carson, met members of the county uniformed police under Captain Dyer outside the Rock Castle Roadhouse. The cashier, Bill Raper, was waiting for them. Which cabin are they in, Mr. Raper? That one with the lights on, Captain Edmondson. All right, men. Sussman and Fraser, you stick with me. All right, Captain. Captain. Now, we'll go to the front of the house. Shipley, you and Carson cover the back with Captain Dyer. You got that? Right, Captain. What's our plan, Captain? Simply to close in and get those bandits. We can't start shooting till we're absolutely sure these are the men we want. But if they show the slightest resistance, open fire with riot guns immediately. Ready? Yes, sir. Let's go. Watch it. They turned out the lights. Better stand back. I'll knock. Open up. Who is it? Police. Just a minute. Hurry it up. All right, coppers. Come and get it. Get back, friend. Just listen, those bullets bounce. All right, men, open up with your riot guns. Right, Captain. Get down low, babe. Those cops are using riot guns. We'll fix them, Jimmy. I'll load your pistol. Roger. Yeah? Cover the back door. I'll cover the front. Okay, Charles. Come on, coppers. Try and take it. You'd better give up in there. You're surrounded. We'll give them hot lead. Give me another cat, babe. This one's empty. Hey, I, Jimmy. How is it in the back, Rogers? Can't see him. It's too dark out there. Well, they're all around us, Jimmy. Get down, babe. Oh. 
Babe, you hit. Oh, my head. I told you to keep down. All right, coppers. You got my gal. I'll show you can't get away with that. Charleston. Charleston, there's a copper creeping up in the back. You cover the front, Rogers. I'll get that cop. He's coming right up to the back door. What are you going to do, Jimmy? Shut up, babe. I'm running this show. Open your hands, all three of you. I'm waiting for you, cop. Jimmy, you killed him. I'll say I killed him. I got his gun, too. Oh. Jimmy, they got Rogers. Lie down on the floor, babe. I'll get him for that. All right, coppers. I got one of you. Who's next? Yes, Fraser. They killed Shipley. Shipley? How? He broke in the back door. Shot down before he had a chance. Ah, but dirty dogs. Give me a rat gun, Fraser. Yes, mine's empty. Captain... I'm going after him. Now, wait. Don't go up there. It's probably a trap. There goes one of them out the side door. Stop her up fire. He's running for the woods. I can't see him. There, between those big trees. <laughs> Missed him. It's so dark, I can't see. Oh, we'll never find him in this darkness. What will we do, Captain? He might be hurt. Dyer, you and Carson follow him. I am going to get some bloodhounds. <laughs> What's the matter with the dogs, Captain? Why are they stopping? Too dark for them? I'm afraid they lost the trail, Fraser. What, after we've followed their banner for almost eight miles? It's all right, Sussman. Those bloodhounds have told me just what I want to know. Uh, that'll get you, Captain. For the last two miles, the bandit's trail has followed right along these railroad tracks. That's right. But now we've lost it. I can't see what that is. We're headed toward Chattanooga, not away from it. Doesn't that mean anything to you men? You mean you thought maybe the bandit would jump afraid away from Chattanooga? No, Sussman. I thought he'd head for Chattanooga, but I'm, I couldn't be sure. Now I know he's gone back to the city where we can lay our hands on him. With one of the nickel and dime bandits, Joe Rogers, dead, Colonel, and the bandit's girlfriend in a prison hospital, the Chattanooga police combed the city for the remaining bandit now definitely identified as James Charlson. Later that night, after visiting hundreds of rooming houses, two police officers, Patrolman Fraser and Sussman, climbed the stairs of a cheap rooming house an hour after midnight. What number the landlady say, Fraser? Room six. Yeah. It's room number six, right up there at the head of the stairs. Yeah. Landlady said her new boarder arrived an hour ago. Have your gun ready. You bet I will, Sussman. You turn on your flashlight. I'll try the door. Right. It doors unlocked. That's lucky. Careful now. Yep. Easy, easy. There, he's in bed. Sound asleep. Wonder if he's a guy we want. He's pretty young for a bandit. Let's make sure, Sussman. Pull down the covers. A pistol lay on his right hand. And another one next to him. He's starting to wake up. Grab him. I'm with you. Look on him. I didn't do nothing. I got him, Fraser. Put the bracelets on him. Charlton, you're all through. You come to crazy. I'm not the guy you want. No. Turn on right, Fraser. Right. Let's see those two guns. That don't prove nothing, Cobbler. I didn't kill nobody. I like guns. See, I collect them. Yeah? Well, this is one gun you never should have collected, Charlton. It's the gun you took from Detective Shipley after you killed him. And it's the last gun you're ever going to collect. And so, Colonel Schwarzkopf, through splendid police work and excellent citizen cooperation, the criminal activities of James Charlson came to an abrupt end. Placed on trial in my court for robbery and murder on February 27th, 1940, he was quickly found guilty. I sentenced him to life imprisonment in the Tennessee State Penitentiary. He is there at this very moment. And what happened to the girl who was with Charlson and Roger, Judge Miller? For months, she hovered between life and death with a bullet touching her brain. The doctor said her mental faculties would be impaired indefinitely, and under the circumstances, she was freed in the custody of her parents. Thank you, Judge Miller, for a fine case. I'm particularly pleased with the way you brought out the great value of public cooperation with the authorities. When the police thus frankly solicit help from our law-abiding citizens and those citizens promptly and comprehensively cooperate, no criminal can escape. 
every time the police and the people work together, the end is inevitable. Crime does not pay. And now, the clues. Special bulletin, all citizens. Watch for murderer, 24, 5 feet 5 inches, 135 pounds, dark brown hair slicked back, brown eyes. This man with tall, sandy-haired companion, having wrinkled face, wanted for brutal murder several days ago, refrigeration engineer near San Antonio, Texas, may be traveling in black Ford station wagon and may have in possession a 44 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver with cedar handle. Warning, citizens of Pennsylvania, be on lookout for man, 28, 5 feet 8 inches, 160 pounds, brown hair, gray eyes, occupation farmer. This man wanted in connection with feud slaying last week, Indian Head section of Fayette County, Pennsylvania. <coughs> If you have any information concerning these clues, notify your local police, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or gangbusters at once. For Sloan's Liniment next week, the case of the missing corpse. Here reenacted for the first time, the inside factual account of one of the most fantastic cases in all criminology. Learn how a dead man faced his murderer. Sloan's Liniment brings you one of Phillips H. Lord's most astounding dramatizations in America's Crusade. Against crime. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Presenting Orson Welles as the third man. The Lives of Harry Lyme. The fabulous stories of the immortal character originally created in the motion picture The Third Man. With zither music by Anton Kara. That was the shot that killed Harry Lyme. He died in a sewer beneath Vienna. As those of you know who saw the movie, The Third Man. Yes, that was the end of Harry Lyme. But it was not the beginning. Harry Lyme had many lives. And I can recount all of them. How do I know? It's very simple. Because my name is Harry Lyme. I've known many places and left them, made many friends and lost them, won many fortunes and spent them. My fate seems to be linked to a cosmic yo-yo. This is a story of a low point on one of the yo-yo trips down. This particular low point is known on the map as the island of Haiti. 
I arrived there as a sort of political refugee, a small revolution I'd been promoting in a nearby banana republic. It fizzled out on me, and the general I'd been backing backed out, and I found myself holding the bag. The bag, luckily, just happened to contain a few rolls of the U.S. Treasury's best lettuce. So when I descended on Haiti, I did it with style. Then, after a while, I spent the style. Don't let anybody tell you about the easy life on these tropical islands. You need dough in paradise, too. Of course, I still had my friends among the natives, but... Even they had become devoted students of the Rubiats. That is, they took the cash and let the credit go. And now, Orson Welles is Harry Lyme, the third man in Voodoo. I am sorry, Monsieur Harry, no more. Oh, come on now, Georges. You've got a clean white cuff there, even for a bartender. Monsieur Harry, please understand. My boss, he supply my cuff. <laughs> I cannot mark it up any further. Georges, are you trying to tell me that money makes that much difference to you? Do you prefer that sort of customer to me, that, that ambassador of ill will over there? The Babbitt who comes to Haiti to find somebody new in Toledo? Or do you prefer... Monsieur Harry, I prefer you. Oh, well, merci, old Every man. Every native I... on this island prefers Monsieur Harry. Well, then it's settled, huh? But the boss, he prefers his customer with the money. Oh, I should have known. Somehow, Georges, it never occurred to me that you'd sell out like the rest, go commercial. But, well, you, you've you been trapped too, Georges, cornered, impaled on the almighty dollar side. No, 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 mon ami, I well, mean... Well, Georges, it's getting late. Time for me to move on, I guess. That's your greatest fault, Harry Lyon. Always moving on. Hmm? What? And it's always getting so late. Dorna. <laughs> Hello, Harry, darling. Dorna, you beautiful, wonderful witch. Oh. What are you doing? Uh-uh. Let's not be trite, Harry. I could ask you the same question. Okay, then. Whom are you doing here? <laughs> Harry, darling. Three years haven't changed you a bit. Well, who is he? That one? No, no. Over there. The seer sucker suit. Oh, no, Dorna. Oh, he's really quite charming, Harry. Charming, huh? He's an oaf. I don't like the way he laughs. Oh, you'd adore him, darling. <laughs> he pinches waitresses, collects souvenirs, collects money, too. Ah, I might have known. He's with you. <laughs> well, let's meet him. And now, Harry. After you, mademoiselle. Oh, and, uh, Georges, you might tell your boss that Harry Lyme is on the preferred list again. I spent several pleasant moments following Dorna to the booth as she snaked her way adroitly between the tables. It was difficult for me to focus my attention on her. Mark. Mark, in this case, was fat and perspiring. Of course, he was bald. His contributions to the aromas of the cafe were generous. His cigar, his perspiration, and his money. Sam? Huh? Oh, hiya, baby. I was just going to send out a searching party for you. <laughs> uh, Sam, I'd like you to meet an old friend of mine, huh? Harry Lyme. Sam Torkin. Oh, very happy to meet you, Mr. Torkin. Oh, sit down, sit down. Any friend of Dorna's is a friend of mine. Well, within reason, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good. Uh, you from the States, too, Larry? Uh, Harry, Sam. Harry Lyme. Huh? Oh, yeah, Harry. Yeah, what part of the States are you from? I'm from Toledo. Toledo. Yeah. Eh? One of my plants is in Toledo. <laughs> a drink. Yeah, have a drink. Waiter, bring my friend a drink. Eh? <laughs> Toledo, eh? <laughs> great little town. Yes, Toledo. sir. <laughs> of course, to me, any town's a great town as long as business is good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> hey, you know, I'm. This is my first vacation in 18 years. 18 years. Can you imagine that? <laughs> He gabbled. For eternities, he gabbled. Dorna was obviously abused by my boredom, but my patience is always at a price. Torkin kept gabbling till I almost considered reducing that price, and then he gave me my cue. Uh, sure is hot in these parts. Well, baby, come on, let's go out of this dump and find some souvenirs. Oh, Sam, not again. Now, what sort of souvenirs are you looking for, Mr. Torkin? Hmm? Oh, I don't know. The souvenirs are... Well, uh, souvenirs, ain't they? Now, come on, beautiful, let's... Uh, souvenirs can be more than souvenirs, Mr. Torkin. No, Lime, what kind of talk is now, that? Now, now, look, Mr. Torkin, you're a man of taste and means. Hey, a sales pitch! <laughs> hey, what are you selling, Lime? Yes, Harry, what are you selling? Uh, well, selling, I'm, I'm selling nothing, nothing but plain, ordinary common sense. It's at a premium on this island, Mr. Torkin. Yeah? Oh. Let him finish Let me tell you about Haiti, both of you. This island is steeped in sediment. Not our kind, not the lace trim sort of thing. Sediment here is a wild, untamed, primitive love, a sense of possession that defies the laws of man and nature. Now, listen to those drums, Torquil. Listen. They're telling you the secrets of Haiti. Huh? 
Huh? Do you understand them, Harry? As much as any civilized man is permitted to. Oh, yeah, that's, that's that voodoo stuff, ain't it? Well, they're not stuff, Tork. Those drums are calling to the voodoo gods to smile upon the wedding of a native man and his beloved. The wedding rites are just beginning. They'll continue till dawn. It's the wedding of Fancy and Grigri. Who? Fancy. Works as a waiter in a hotel here in town. His father got in a jam once with a plant, and I just happened to save his neck. That counts for something here in Haiti. Oh, that reminds me. If you'll excuse me. Hey, where are you going? I'm going to the wedding. You're going up there? Oh, take us with you. Well, I wish I could, Dorna, but, well, I... Hey, 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 wait a minute now. Sit down, sit down. Oh, what about all this uh, sentiment and souvenirs and all? Well, all right. Look. Haiti is crawling with priceless relics. Anthropological prizes, historical symbols. They bring fantastic prices from any museum in the States. Oh, where do they sell them? Well, they're not selling them, Torka. You've got to know the island. You've got to know the people to find them. Well, how come they're worth so much? Sentiment, old man, sentiment. The voodoo brand. The natives protect their sacred symbols with their lives. And of course, they're, they're the raw materials. Huh? Little sentimental trinkets, diamonds, rubies, sapphires, miscellaneous baubles. The kind of sentiment we understand. Oh, I love souvenirs like that. Oh, uh-huh. Well, okay, Lime. I guess you can get me one of them baubles. Yes, that's possible. Now, what's your deal? Well, first, let me find a suitable trinket. Time enough, then, to bargain. For now, Mr. Torkin, a small retainer will do. Huh? Mm. Oh, uh, yeah, well, uh, how much? Oh, as you wish, as you wish. But, uh, as those drums would tell you, sentiment comes high in Haiti. <laughs> I had a feeling that Dorna would keep Sam Torkin well occupied for the present. The future, of course, I'd handle in my own way. And in the meantime, there's nothing to worry about except keeping a date with two old friends. I found my friends in the clearing. Fancy and Gregory, the head of the ceremonial party in a place of honor, as befitted them. Ah, Monsieur Ari, we don't think you ever come. No, I wouldn't have missed it, Fancy. You and Gregory are my favorite people. Oh, thank you. You are kind. You say that so often, Gregory. I must believe it. Seriously, I wish you both much happiness. Merci, merci. We will be happy always when we have friends like Ari Lyle. You have done so much for us. Our family, we cannot forget you. Fancy, old man. You go far with a wife like this. She says all the right things. It is the time. Oh, the marriage ceremony? Oh, no, no. We are married already. It is the moment to pledge ourselves to the authority. Authority? It is a tribal custom. Fancy. Please, Ari, these are tribal secrets. Oh, you don't trust your old friend with secrets? We can trust no one with this secret. Fancy. Fancy, what's happening? What's that? It is the authority, the scepter, the sacred scepter of Henri Christophe. The scepter of Henri Christophe. Well, here was the souvenir for talking. <laughs> All right, Lime, all right, all right. Who is this Henri no, Christophe? No, Torkin, you mean to say you never heard of him? Nah. Christophe was, well, he was the, the, the George Washington of Haiti. Oh, every two-bit country's got its own Washington. Get me Washington scepter and I'm interested. Listen, listen, old man. Christophe started life as a slave. He became Haiti's most powerful ruler. At one point in his regime, Torkin, he stood off the combined armies of France and England with 2,000 men. On the north end of this island, old man, up near Le Cap. Huh? Le Cap, Cap Tien. Tremendous fortress high on the hill, above the jungle. You've seen it, haven't you? Well, how could I miss it? It's big enough. It's one of the biggest. Washington didn't build that, Torkin. Christoph did. So what? He didn't just order it, Bill. He planned it, designed it, supervised the work, dug rocks out of the mountains with his bare hands. You're a self-made man, Torkin. That ought to appeal to you. What about the scepter line? Look, old man. Henri Christoph is a landlocked saint to these people, an all-powerful earth god. While he lived, his scepter was his symbol of strength and wealth. Being king in those days was a profitable business, old man. Christophe had more jewels in that scepter than Dorna has curves. Then there was a revolt here in Haiti, and Christophe was found dead, but the scepter was gone. For over a hundred years, its whereabouts have been kept secret. I know the secret, Torquem. I can get it for you. Yeah? How? It's my business. Your business is to make it worth my while. <sighs> okay, Lime. How much this time? Oh, plenty, old man. Fancy. 
Fancy, where are you? Oh, oh Gregory. Enter, Ari. Oh, you are welcome in the house of Fancy and Gregory. Ari, my friend Ari. Ah, it is Fancy, good. I've been looking for you. I've got to talk to you. Oh, we are always eager to listen. Fancy, it's, it's that scepter. Scepter of all. <gasps> oh. What's the matter? Oh, Ari, please, you must not ask. These are secrets of our people. But I've always considered myself one of your people, Gregory. My friend Ari, I, I have told you too much already. Please do not think any more of the scepter. It is forbidden to speak of it. Forbidden among friends? Ari, with the scepter, it is different. It is the authority. Is it? It is. It is the scepter of Henri Christophe. It is passed down from high priest to high priest. It is never out of their hands. It is the authority. Oh, that is enough to know. Please, ask no more. Gregory, would I ask if it weren't important? No, Ari, please. I've got to know more about it, Gregory. Fancy, you understand, don't you? Gregory... Oh, don't make him say more, Ari, please. Don't make him say more, please. Please, please. <laughs> Yeah, come in. Fancy. Come in, old man. Come in. Ari, you do not mind that I come here? Of course not. Any time. What's the trouble? I do not know. It is not my trouble. Eh? When you are at my house today, I see you have great trouble. I try to tell Grigri, but she do not understand. Trouble me? No, no, no. Wait a minute. I am tell her you are, must have great trouble or you would not ask for tribal secrets. Oh, well... It is all right, Ari. You are my friend. When you are in trouble, I help you. Oh, well... Well, good. That's the spirit, old man. You have done much for me and Grigri. This is for you. Oh? It is the scepter of Henri Christophe. It's... Fancy. It is yours. I could do no less. Fancy, it's... Now... It's... <laughs> you will have no more trouble, Ari. Well, now, wait a minute. Well, what about you? How did you get this thing, anyway? It is no matter. You stole it from the high priest. What if they find out you took it? They won't go to the police. No. They won't put you in jail? No. Well, what will they do? They will not put me in jail. They will not go to the police. The priest will be my judge. Fancy. What will they do? They will punish me. I will die. Orson Welles returns in just a moment as the third man. And now Orson Welles, as the third man, continues with Voodoo. Had I known a man like Fancy earlier in my life, my ideas about all men might just possibly be a little different today. Here was the truest kind of friend. True in the real sense of the word true. He was staking his life, literally, staking his life on his faith in <laughs> airy lime. If I rejected his offer of the sacred scepter, I'd have shattered his faith in me. And fancy lived by his faith in his friends. And I did need the scepter. As for friends, well, there are many kinds of friendship. Harry. Mm. Tell the truth. Hmm? Oh, sure. Donna, my love, you're ravishing. Oh, no. Not that. About the scepter. No. Oh, hmm. You got a cigarette? Mm-hmm. Here. Thanks. Is it really the scepter of Henri Cristo? Mm -hmm. Think Sam will buy it? Why not? Why is it so valuable? Historical significance, cluster of rubies, big fat sapphire in the middle. Harry. Mm -hmm. What's it really worth? Oh, 20,000, maybe 25. Move the ashtray over. Hmm? <laughs> Bet Talkin would give me 35,000 for it. Think so? Mm hmm. I'm prettier than you. <laughs> right. But I have Christoph's scepter. Oh, but darling, if you let me peddle it to Talkin. Dorna, my sweet, I lost you three years ago in Madagascar. The scepter might be a temptation if you leave me again. Oh, no. <laughs> Never no, mind that Harry. stuff. Never mind. I'll cut it off now. <laughs> Wouldn't 35000 be nicer than twenty-five? Mm hmm Then why don't you let me Dorna, have the it? the fact is, I don't have a scepter. What? <laughs> 
talking. Bought it this morning. Fifty thousand dollars. Harry, you, <laughs> you. <laughs> That's why you lost me in Madagascar. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, well, guess I've got to work on talking again. <laughs> Good old Sam. Yeah. Good old Sam. <laughs> Somehow, good old Sam ran a bad second. Donna was no fool. She wasn't greedy. I was available, and I had money. Not as much as talking, of course, but enough to keep her satisfied temporarily. We decided on a small celebration, the sort that requires noisy public demonstrations with champagne bottles. We went to a little cafe, and I rather enjoyed the impression I was making, particularly on Georges. Would you like me to put this on your bill, Monsieur? Oh, Ying? certainly not, Georges, certainly not. I, I wouldn't want to cause any undue strain or suffering for your employer. But, Monsieur... Never mind, Georges, old man. Here, this should cover the situation, I think. Only oh, here, here's a little something for you. Thank you, Monsieur. You are... Oh, that... What's the matter? You will excuse me, Mr. Ray. I must go. Eh? I'm sorry, I must close the bar. Close the bar at this time of night? Just a minute. The drums, Monsieur Ray, you understand? The drums. The drums? What? Why, uh, George? It's the death drums. I do not have to tell you, Monsieur Ray. Why? What for? I don't know. You will excuse me. Harry, what is it? I don't know. Those are, those are the death drums. They mean someone's dead or dying. Or going to die. Going to die? Who? I don't know. I don't know. I have a hunch. I hope I'm wrong. Harry! Wait! Where are you going? Harry! Harry! When I got to the ceremonial grounds, I saw a frenzied sight, hundreds of natives, still dressed in the tattered dungarees of the cane fields, dancing, shrieking, half-hypnotized. The drums. They were the drums of death, all right. I'm mistaking it. As I crashed through the brush surrounding the clearing, I saw that they'd already, already taken a life. There was a body, a dead body, strapped to a post in the center of the circle. Sam talking. The voodoo priest danced up and back in front of it, waving curses over it and screaming through the slits in a hideous mask. And in his hand, he held the scepter of Henri Christophe, the scepter that had cost Torkin more than he'd bargained for. I'd had enough. I turned to leave. And then at the far end of the clearing, I saw something else. Two more bodies tied together, back to back hanging by their wrists from a long cross pole strung between two trees. The two of them together, Fancy and Grigri, ready to be sacrificed. No! No, wait, stop! Stop it, I tell you! Listen, all of you, listen, listen to me! You're making a mistake, you're torturing, you're torturing two innocent people, you can't do it! They have wronged us! was forbidden. They must be punished. No. They will die. Well, they, they can't die. You're punishing them for something they didn't do. You think they sold the scepter to this man, but they didn't. I, I did. I made Fancy tell me about it. I'm the one you want. Listen to me. You've got to believe me. Harry Lime would not cause their death. Harry Lime is their friend. But I tell you it's my deal. And I'm the guy you want. So untie these ropes. Come on, move, or there'll be a new voodoo priest holding forth at your funeral. It's no use, Harry Lime. If you kill me, others will take the revenge. It's no use to kill these two, either. Okay, Grigri, you're loose. Help untie Fancy. Okay, I'll do it myself. Hold still, Fancy. There, you're loose. All right, come on. Come on, I'll get you two out of this. Now we're even. Hurry. It is too late. You must go. Nuts, come on, I'll help you now. Run for it. Stay back, you lunatics, or I'll start knocking off voodoos. I want you now. Stay back. That's better. Come on, Fancy. Rigby, get going. Well... There goes Haiti, Donna. 
Another corner of the world chipped off. You'll be back, Harry. No. Fancy and Grigri are going to Cuba. And time people learn the truth about me. Uh -uh. Hades through with Harry Lyme. You're really taking this seriously, aren't you? Mm, after my fashion. After my fashion. Guess I messed up your meal ticket too, didn't I? Sam talking? Poor Sam. <sighs> Don't worry, Harry. You'll take care of me. Until the 50,000 is gone. Well. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. Well, let's have a drink. <laughs> Harry Lyme returns in just a moment. And now, Harry Lyme. <laughs> I know what you're saying. You're saying that wasn't Harry Lyme at all. You're saying the noble hero that pulled off that fancy rescue party wasn't the third man he was a couple of other guys just goes to show how i misjudged well ask fancy and grigory now happily keeping house in a suburb of havana they'll tell you it really was harry lyme that got them out of that whole voodoo mess of course they'll also remind you that i got them into it and they might possibly mention that as the three of us dashed off into the jungle i paused just long enough to borrow that scepter back from the high priest's Got a nice price for it, too, from a collector in Brussels. But that's another story. So long now, and if anybody should run into Dorna anywhere, in Timbuktu, for example, or the store club, give her my love. Remind her she owes me about 15,000 hard-earned American bucks, which seem to have slipped out of a hole in my pocket or something. No hard feelings, of course, but if you get a choice between voodoo, hoodoo, and little Dorna, I hope you'll know what to do about it. Take the voodoo every time. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. The first letter seemed harmless enough possibly even just the result of a mistaken delivery. The second one drew concern, and paired with the unexplained visions of something darkly unsettling, Sam Morris finally caves. The everyman safe world he lives in is about to take a drastic and dark turn. He quickly falls into a world of insanity, the morbid and the macabre. He's drawn into a darkness that is just as deadly as it is mysterious. A darkness that dwells in a house that could only be conjured up by a mad brain. It is a house that calls you, a house that haunts you with its ghosts. They'll scratch and claw through your fragile hide, bringing madness bubbling to the surface. Come see the ghosts for yourself, if you dare. Weird Darkness Publishing presents of a Mad Brain by Scott Donnelly. Now available on paperback, ebook, and audiobook versions through Amazon and WeirdDarkness.com. Yes, sir. Have you seen Mr. Clayton anywhere? Mr. Clayton, sir? Uh, he was here a minute ago. 
Uh, oh, there he is, sir. The window seat in the corner. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry, didn't see him. Thank you. And so, there I was, standing with my golf club ready. <laughs> ah, Sanderson. Ah, there you are, at last. Hello, Clayton. Hello, old boy. Hello, Evans. Wish. Hello, Sanderson. I'm terribly sorry being so late. Thought you weren't coming. No, I really am truly sorry. Had trouble with the car. Oh, oh. not an accident, I hope. No, nothing like that. Just a mechanical fault. Serious? Nothing I couldn't sort out myself, fortunately, but it held me up for over an hour. How I admire people with practical minds, <laughs> see? Well, you look none the worse for wear, anyway. Well, I've been up to my room to clean up and change. Where have you put your clubs, then? Left them in the car. Thought I'd pick them up as we go out. Ah. I didn't know whether you might be out on the course already. Well, start without you, Sanderson. What kind of chaps do you think we are? <laughs> your late arrival gave us an excuse for another drink. Uh, Clayton is determined to win today, Sanderson, yeah. even if he has to resort to getting the competitors totally drunk. Oh, what a ah. thing to say, old boy. <laughs> Most unsportsmanlike. <laughs> Jerry! Coming, sir. Same again, please. What do you want, Sanderson? Look, as I was late, let me get them, will Nonsense. you? Nonsense. No, please, I'd like to. Won't hear of it, old boy. What do you want? Well, pink gin, if you don't mind. And a pink gin, Jerry. Large one. No, look, steady on. What's the matter, Sanderson? With one of those inside you, you'd be able to hole in one. <laughs> Mark my words. <laughs> uh, who was the last club member to hole in one? Don't tell me you've forgotten, Wish. Hmm. Weatherby. Stop. Stanley Weatherby. Yes. That's right. Holding one didn't buy a soul a drink, not even his partner. Holding one didn't even set foot in the bar. Oh, I remember now. Clearly, yes. no gentleman. I was here the day it happened. I saw it with my own eyes. News spread like wildfire. He came back, looked at his watch, huh? mumbled something about being in a hurry, acknowledged members who were applauding him, got into his rows, drove off. God, yes. That was a cat. Owned half of Yorkshire. Half of Yorkshire, Clayton. All oh, right, Sanderson. A third. <laughs> well, <laughs> certainly several villages around the Millers. <laughs> of course, he, he, he didn't remain a member for long. Sure hope not. It was put to him, tactfully, of course, that it simply wasn't done. Not in golfing circles or any other circles frequented by a gentleman. Why? As he wasn't considered a gentleman, he was told to leave forthwith. Yeah. I was on the management committee at the time. He cried. Oh, come on, Clayton. I tell you, he cried, Sanderson. Well, very nearly. Mm. Eyes were moist. <clears throat> ah, a Here we are, gentlemen. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, sir. On my tab. No, no, I, oh, no, no. I, I, it's my tab, really. Actually, I, I, I think it's my right. This time. For heaven's sake, will you stop arguing like a lot of old women? <laughs> this is my treat. Thank you, Jerry. Sir? Cheers, then. Oh, oh, cheers. Well. Cheers, Clayton. Cheers, old man. Thank you. Now, now, listen to me. I feel lucky today. I'll put a fiver in the kitty for anyone who gets three under par. Uh -huh. now, how about it? Three under par? Oh, come on, wish, old man. You can play jolly well when you put your mind to it. Well... And money has a way of concentrating the mind. Uh -huh. I'm game. <laughs> Thought you might be, Evans. <laughs> what about you, Sarnison? Hmm. All right? Right. We'll down this lot and then tea off, eh? Right. I've ordered roast duck for dinner tonight. Aha. Uh -huh. How's that? Marvellous. Uh, uh, I, I think we should have done uh, that. Really some contribution here. Oh, no. Look, I tell you, my friends, I feel lucky. I'll be taking that 15 pounds off you later on when I win our little bet. <laughs> So you'll be paying for dinner anyway. Well, Clayton, you were true to your word. Hmm? We ended up paying for the meal. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> well, I knew you would. You just feel lucky, that's all. <coughs> More brandy, anyone? Not for me, thank you. No, no, thank you. Uh, just a little, please, Clayton, yes. Mm, we can finish this decanter together, eh, you wish, old chap? Oh, I, I, I don't know about that. I, I can't move as it is. Well, you don't have to move to enjoy brandy, old boy. Just lie there, soak it up. <laughs> Like a Christmas pudding. <laughs> <laughs> there. Oh, thank you, thank you. 
poke the fire, someone. It's getting low. I'll hold it. Thank you, wish, old boy. Yeah, that's better. You know, I stayed here last night. No, neither did I. I was absolutely alone in the place. Oh, not absolutely alone, surely. What about the domestics? Oh, well, of course the domestics were here, wish. But they sleep in the other wing. Well. Yes. Hmm. You were going to say... No, nothing, nothing. nothing. Yes, yes, you were, Clayton. Something happened last night. Well, I, uh... I caught a ghost, actually. Caught a ghost, did you? Yes. And where is it? Caught a ghost! You must tell us about it. You don't seem in the least bit surprised, Evans. I suppose your four weeks in the great spaces of America have made you impervious to such pronouncements. <laughs> Not at all, old boy. I'm interested to see whether your story matches the size of some of those the Americans have a habit of telling at the drop of a hat. Yeah, or, or an oil well, eh? Mm. <laughs> I see. Mm. Mm. Wish, old chap. Uh, yes, Clint? Close the door, will you? Huh? I, I know no one deliberately eavesdrops in the club, but I wouldn't want to upset our very excellent service with any rumours of ghosts. Oh, come no, no. on, And this ghost, well, it wasn't a normal ghost. Don't think it'll come back again, ever. <coughs> Are you serious? Close the door, Wish. There's a good fellow. Oh. Right. <clears throat> you mean to say you didn't keep it? Are you actually taking him seriously, Sanders? The truth is, I hadn't the heart to. You hadn't the heart to do what? Keep it. You are serious? Yes. A ghost? Yes. Come on, Clayton, you've drunk too much brandy. The fact is, it really was a ghost, I'm sure of it. As sure as I'm talking to you now. I'm not joking. I mean what I say. <sighs> well, I think I will have a little more brandy, if you don't mind, please, Wish. Oh, yes, yes, of course, Evans. It's the strangest thing that's ever happened to me in my life. You know, I never believed in ghosts or anything of the sort before, ever. And then I bag one in the corner. You, uh... You talk to it? Yes. For the space of an hour or more, I suppose. Chatty. Poor devil was in trouble. Sobbing, was he? If you must know, yes, poor fellow. I, I, I never realised the poor sort of thing a ghost might be. I took an advantage. Look, Clayton, I, I don't understand. You're, you're having us on, aren't you? No, don't you understand? Yet? A person remains just the same person, even though he's disembodied. That's a thing we too often forget. People with a certain strength and fixity of purpose, most haunting ghosts, you know, must be as single-minded, as monomaniacs and as opposite as mules to come back again and again. This poor creature wasn't like that. Good God. I say it in all kindliness, but that is the plain truth of the case. Even at the first glance, he struck me as being weak. Well, I don't know. You don't know what, Evans? I don't know what to say. Well, don't say anything, my friend. Just listen. I came upon him in the long passage. His back was towards me, and I saw him first. Right off, I knew him for a ghost. He was transparent and whitish. Clean through his chest, I could see the glimmer of the little window at the end. And not only his physique, but his attitude struck me as being weak. He looked as though he didn't know what to do. Well, what sort of physique? Uh, lean. Uh, you know, uh, that sort of young man's neck that has two great flutings down the back here and here. And a little meanish head with scrubby hair and rather bad ears. Shoulders bad, hmm. narrower than the hips. Uh, turned down collar... A ready-made short jacket, trousers baggy, and a little frayed at the heels. I came very quietly up the staircase, and I saw him. I stopped dead at that, taking him in. I wasn't a bit afraid. I think that in most of these affairs one is never nearly so afraid or excited as one imagines one might be. I was surprised and interested. Hmm. I thought, good Lord! 
appears a ghost at last. And I hadn't believed for a moment in ghosts during my whole life. Mm. <clears throat> I suppose I wasn't on the landing a moment before he found out I was there. He turned on me sharply, and I saw the face of a, an immature young man. A weak nose, scrubby little moustache, and a feeble chin. So, for an instant, we stood. He looking over his shoulder at me, and, and we regarded one another. Then he seemed to remember his high calling. He turned round drew himself up, projected his face, raised his arms, spread his hands in approved ghost fashion, and came towards me. As he did so, his little jaw dropped, and he emitted a faint, drawn-out boo. Oh. <laughs> it, it wasn't a bit dreadful. <laughs> boo, I said. You don't belong to this place. What are you doing here? Are you a member? I said. And just to show him I didn't care a pin for him, I stepped through a corner of him and made to light my candle. What are you doing here? I said. He, he dropped his hands and stopped his going, and there he stood, abashed and awkward. The ghost of a weak, silly, aimless young man. I am haunting, he said. You haven't any business to, I said. I'm a ghost, he said. <laughs> <laughs> well, that may be, but you haven't any business to haunt here. This is a respectable private club. If I were you, I wouldn't wait for Cockrow. I'd vanish right away. Well, he looked embarrassed. The fact is, sir, I can't, he said. You can't, I said. No, sir, there's something I've forgotten. I've been hanging about here since midnight last night, hiding in the cupboards of empty bedrooms and things like that. I'm flurried. I've never come <clears throat> haunting before, and it seems to put me out. Come on, Clayton, you can't be serious. Leave him, leave him, Evans. Let him continue. Yeah, let's hear the end of it, at least. Put you out, I said. Yes, sir. I've tried to do it several times, and it doesn't come off. Some little thing has slipped me, and I can't get back. Well, that rather bowled me over. He looked at me in such an abject way that for the life of me I couldn't keep up quite the high hectoring vein that I'd adopted. Mm. Oh, that's queer, then, I said. And as I spoke, I fancied I heard someone moving about down below. Come into my room and tell me about it, I said. So we did. Sit on the armchair and tell me, old chap, how you got yourself into this awkward position, I said. Are you telling us that you sat together in your bedroom upstairs? Oh, no. no. He said he wouldn't sit down. He'd prefer to flit up and down the room if it was all right by me. And so he did. And in a little while, we were deep in a long and serious talk. He hadn't a particularly honest face. But being transparent, of course, he couldn't avoid telling the truth. Eh? I, uh, I, I don't... What, what, what's that? What, what's that wish? Being transparent. Couldn't avoid telling the truth. I, I don't see it. I don't see it. But it is so, I can assure you. I don't believe he got once a nail's breadth off the Bible truth. He, he told me how he'd been killed. He went down into a London basement with a candle to look for a leakage of gas. Poor wretch. That's what I thought. And the more he talked, the more I thought it. There he was, purposeless in life and purposeless out of it. He talked of his father and his mother and his schoolmaster and all who had ever been anything to do with him in the world. He'd been too sensitive too nervous. None of them had ever valued him properly or understood him, he said. He'd never had a real friend in the world, I think. Never had a success. Shirked games and failed examinations. Mm. And where are you now? I asked. And what did he say to that? Well, he wasn't clear on the point at all. The impression he gave me was of a sort of vague, intermediate state. A special reserve for souls too non-existent for anything so positive as either sin or virtue. Ah, I don't know. He was much too egotistical and unobservant to give me any clear idea of the kind of place, the kind of country there is on the other side of things. Mm. Wherever he was, he seemed to have fallen in with a set of kindred spirits, ghosts of weak, uh, cockney young men, who were on a footing of Christian names, and among these, there was certainly a lot of talk about going haunting. Really? Yeah, <laughs> things like that. 
Yeah. Going haunting? They seem to think haunting a tremendous adventure. Most of them funked it all the time. And did you think this haunting of theirs to be a tremendous adventure for you, Clayton? Oh. <laughs> you still don't believe it, do you? Yeah, go on, Clayton. You see, Sanderson, it appeals to the actor. Ah, yes, but Wish here is a professional actor. You're not. Now, uh, at the moment, I can see clear through you. Mm. Anyway, these are the impressions he gave me. Oh, I may, of course, have been in a rather uncritical state. But that was the sort of background he gave to himself. He kept flitting up and down with his thin voice going, talking about his wretched self, and never a word of clear, firm statement from first to last. He was thinner and sillier and more pointless than if he'd been real and alive. Only then, you know, he, he wouldn't have been in my bedroom here. Hmm. If he had been alive, I should have kicked hmm. him out. Of course, then, are poor mortals like that. Yeah, and there's just as much chance of their having ghosts uh, as the rest of us. See, what gave a sort of point to him, you know, was the fact that he did seem within limits to have found himself out. The mess he'd made of haunting had depressed him terribly. He'd been told it would be a lark. He'd come expecting it to be a lark. And, and here it was, nothing but another failure added to his record. He paused and stood regarding me. He remarked that, strange as it may seem to me, nobody had given him the amount of sympathy I was giving him now. Don't you brood on these things too much, I said. The thing you've got to do is to get out of this. Get out of this shop. You pull yourself together and try it. I can't, he said. You try, I said. And try, he did. Try? How? Uh, a gleam of interest from Sanderson here at last. Well, well, well. Passes. Passes? What do you mean, passes? A complicated series of gestures and passes with the hands. Now, that's how he'd come in, and that's how he had got to get out again. Lord, what a business I had. But how could any series of passes My possibly... My dear man, you want everything clear. I don't know how. All I know is that you do, that he did. After a fearful time, you know, he got his passes right. And suddenly, he disappeared. Huh. And well, did you observe these passes, these gestures? Yes, yes, yes. It was very strange. I can't, he said. And suddenly he sat down on a little chair at the foot of the bed and began to sob. Lord, what a harrowing, whimpering thing he seemed. You pull yourself together, I said. I tried to pat him on the back and, and my confounded hand went through him. <laughs> By that time, you know, I wasn't nearly so massive as I'd been on the landing. I got the full strangeness of it all. I remember snatching my hand back out of him, as it were, with a little thrill and walking over to the dressing table. You pull yourself together, I said to him, and try. And in order to encourage him and help him, I began to try as well. What, the passes? Yes, the passes. I tried them as well. But wasn't that rather... No, no, this, this is interesting. Oh, it's interesting now, is it, Sanderson? You mean to say that this ghost of yours gave away... Did his level best to give away the whole confounded barrier? Yes. Yes, yeah, he didn't, though. He couldn't. Or oh, he would have gone there too. And that's precisely it. That is precisely it. But at last he did it? At last he did it, yes. I had to keep him up to it hard, but he did it at last, rather suddenly. He despaired. We had a scene. Then he got up abruptly and asked me to go through the whole performance slowly so that he might see. I believe, he said. If I could see, I should spot what was wrong at once. And he did. I know, he said. What do you know, said I. I can't do it if you look at me. I really can't. It's been partly that all along. I'm such a nervous fellow that you put me out. Well, we had an argument. Naturally, I wanted to see. But he was as obstinate as a mule, and suddenly I'd come over as tired as a dog. All right, I said, I won't look at you. And I turned towards the mirror on the wardrobe by the bed. He started off very fast. I tried to follow him by looking in the looking glass. Round went his arms and hands, so and so. And then, with a rush, he came to the last gesture of all. You stand erect and open out your arms. 
like this. Just like this, he stood. And then he didn't. Hmm? I wheeled around from the looking glass to him. There was nothing. I was alone with the flaring candles and a staggering mind. No. What had happened? Hmm? Had anything happened? Had I been dreaming? And then, with an absurd note of finality, the clock upon the landing discovered the moment was right for striking one. So, ping! <clears throat> That's all that happened. And then you went to bed? What else was there to do? And th the passes? Mm, I believe I could do them now. Well, could you really? Yes. They won't work. No, but if they do... I'd rather you didn't, Clayton. Why? I'd rather he didn't, that's all. But he hasn't got them right. All the same, I'd just rather he didn't. Hmm? You, you don't, in all honesty. Well, true or not, to go through those gestures and passes would... Well, it would be mocking a serious matter. Yes, yes, but you, you just can't believe Why it. Why shouldn't I, I believe what he told us? None of us knows what happens after... Well, it's possible, that's all. Clayton, you're too good a liar for us. Most of it was all right, but that disappearance... Tell us, it's a tale of cock and bull, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You watch me, Sanderson. Just you watch me. What are you doing? He's going through the passes. Well, I don't think... Look, Clayton, it was a good tale, but I really don't think you... There! That's very good, Clayton. But uh, as a Freemason and a member of the Lodge of the Four Kings, I know many of these gestures, and there's one little detail left out. Uh, I know. I believe I could tell you which. Well? This one. Right? Yes? That, you know, was what he couldn't get right. Look, how do you... How do you... Look, most of this business, and particularly how you invented it, I don't understand at all, but just that phase I do. Now, these happen to be a series of gestures connected with a certain branch of esoteric masonry, known only to a few, including myself. And I do not see I can do any harm in telling you just the proper twist of the hands. After all, if you know, you know, and if you don't, you don't. I know nothing, except what the poor devil let out last night. Then watch me. Now, the part you got wrong should go... like this. Uh -huh. There. You see? Uh-huh. Now I can do the whole thing right. Can I not? If you want to, yes. I imagine you can. I wouldn't begin, Clayton, if I were you. It's all right. Matter is indestructible. You don't think any jiggity-pokery of this sort is going to snatch Clayton into the world of shades. Not it. You, you may try, Clayton, as far as I'm concerned, until your arms drop off at the shoulders. I don't believe that, Clayton. You've made me half believe in that story somehow, and I... I don't want to see the thing done. My goodness, are you afraid, Wish? I believe that if he goes through these motions right, he'll go. No, no, he'll, he'll not do anything of the sort, because, as we all know, there's only one way out of this world, and Clayton is 30 years from that. Clayton, you're a fool. A damn fool. I decline to argue further. Let the thing be tried. Here goes. No, please! Wish! Please, leave me alone. But supposing... Oh, for thing... God's sake, Wish, shut up! It's up to him! Be quiet, both of you. Don't you see? Are you all so stupid? He's just having us on. It's another of his jokes. You think so, Sanderson? Of course I do. Look at him. His face. What's happening to his face? My God! He's changing! His face it's... is... It's as if he were frozen. And look out! He's falling! Oh, Grab him, someone! All right! All right. I, I, I've got him! He's fainted! Oh, what's happened? Is he all right? It wasn't a joke, was it? No. He's dead.
When Salem Roanoke took a job near his family's new home as a hired hand in the Texas Hill Country, he anticipated learning the rancher's trade, but a series of strange events, shocking murders, and unholy revelations divert him down another path. This terrifying trajectory puts him directly into the middle of a struggle between monsters, magic, and men. Armed and backed by a militia of ranchers, Salem attempts to combat the creeping tide of evil that threatens to engulf his new home and destroy the people most important to him. Will Salem manage to save his home, or have his actions condemn everyone he hopes to save? The Witch Trials – A Summer of Wolves and Season of the Witch by S. R. Roanoke Available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook versions. Look for The Witch Trials by S. R. Roanoke on Amazon or find it on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. Stay where you are. Do not break the stillness of this moment, for this is a time of mystery, a time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is The Haunting Hour. Identified body. A simple situation can become quite intriguing when fate steps in and adds the necessary twists. Take the case of the notorious gang who put a crime reporter on the spot because his articles were dangerous to them. Now, add this twist the fact that the gang has never seen the reporter, and add this twist. The fact that the gangsters flee from a gunfight, carrying with them the unconscious form of a stranger, a man they do not know, a man who happens to be Jim Briggs, the newspaper reporter they would like to lay their hands on. Who am I? Who, who, who am I? Is he on the level, Fred? I think he is, Chief. If you can only teach Schmidt to keep his hands to himself. I didn't do nothing. I only... Shut up. I only... I said shut up. Watch where you're driving. And you still see the cops beating? I think we lost him, Chief. It was a close call. Too close. The town isn't safe for us. Not as long as that guy Briggs hounds us in the Daily Herald. What do we do, Al? We've got to get rid of him. It won't be so easy now. It's either him or us. Schmidt. Yeah? Take the next turn and head back to the hotel in town along Route 7. And let me tell you, Fred, this was Briggs' fault. He just got the cops worked up about us. He's got to go. But how? Uh, where, where am I? Him. What do we do with him? The way things are, we can't risk taking him to a doctor. No, we'd better... Say, wait a minute. I think I can handle him out by myself. Better than a doctor. What do you mean? Just that with Trigger doing a disappearing act and lying low for the time being... You mean maybe this guy... Yeah, you get it. We can use him. Fine. 
Go ahead, then. He's all yours. I don't want any interference. Don't worry. I'll see that these monkeys clam up. You too, Schmidt. I didn't say it. Go ahead. Go ahead, Fred. What's the matter, fella? My head hurts. Now, how'd it happen? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I don't know anything. Who are you? Well, you know me? I'm Fred Booth. Fred Booth? I, I don't remember. Now, look, fella. I'm going to help you. Help me? Look at me. No, look right at me. It's hard to hold my head that way. It hurts. Try. All right, I will. You don't remember anything? No. Let's see about that. Where do you live? I... I don't know. What was your father's name? His name was... I... I don't know. Now, look, fella, you're in a bad way. You've lost your memory. You've got a lot of things to learn again about yourself. Yeah, I understand. I'm going to start off with your name, and then later I'll tell you all we know about you. Thanks, sir. Thanks a lot, Fred. Your name is Trigger Martin. Real name, Henry, but we've always called you Trigger. Oh. That sound familiar? Trigger. Trigger Martin. You remember now? You ever heard the name? Yes. Somehow it seems familiar. Trigger. Trigger, wake up. Huh? Oh. How are you? How's your head? Oh, it's, it's better, friend. You've been sleeping since we got here about three hours ago. Here? Where's here? Oh, oh, I remember the hotel. That's right, the Crescent Hotel. The Crescent Hotel. What else do you remember? Well, everything that you told me. Anything else come back to you? No. Are you sure? Yeah, that's all. Now, what did I teach you? My name is Trigger Martin. You're Fred Booth. Go on. Chief is Al Drake. I was driving with... Uh, George Smith. Now, how about the little fella? He's called Petey. Um, Fred. Yes, Trigger. What, what do we do? We? Yeah, I mean, you're the, the, the brains, aren't you? Well, yes, I'm the guy who figures things out for Al. And Schmidt? Well, Schmidt's good at safe cracking and some of the heavy work. Oh. Petey used to be a dip, a pickpocket. He's got light fingers. Nervous, but good to have around sometimes. Well, what a, what about me? The rest of us have pulled some pretty rough stuff, Trigger, but we've all kept our hands clean of your line. Oh. What is my line? It's murder, Trigger. Murder. How's he getting along, Fred? Trigger. Okay. Your treatment? Well, what's wrong with it? Risky. Nah, he'll be all right. He'd better... We'll need him, but soon. I told him just now that he was a killer. Yeah? Any questions? No, he just wants to learn all about himself. Great. Uh, would you be liking your rooms clean now, Mr. Drake? Sure, any time, Mrs. Calder, but since when do you open doors without knocking? Well, if you're not up at this time of day, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Oh, it's not that, Mrs. Calder, but sometimes we have business conferences and can't be disturbed. Oh, business, is it? Well, I've got a couple of dollars put away I'd like to invest. Uh, Mrs. C., you're a great kidder. Then why should I be kidding? I'd like to live in style like you and Mr. Booth and the other gentlemen. Well, finance is hard work, Mrs. Calder. You'd better stick to cleaning. And that's just what I'll be doing if you gents will let me. Well, I'll start in this inside room and... Uh, 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 Mrs. Calder, I, uh, I don't think you'd better go in there. Not for a couple of days. No? One of our associates is in there sleeping. Mr. Schmidt? No, a new associate. He, uh, he was hurt a little. In a hunting accident. He's got to have rest. Oh, you. I'm thinking you just like to be living in a dirty room. Well... I'll be back later then. I think you'd better. And remember, don't go in there. I'll not be forgetting, Mr. Drake. Chief, we ought to get out of town. Really hide out. They can't pin anything on us yet. Besides, I like to live nice. I like to live. What's eating you? You don't have a murder rap against you? So what? Trigger's the only guy in this mob who ever had the chair to worry about. And now... Al, calm down. Al. Hmm? You saying something about me, Chief? Uh, Trigger, you ought to be taking it easy in your own room. I tried, but every time I lay down, my head started. Something hurting you, Trigger? Not exactly hurting. What then? This business. What you told me before about my... my killing people. I don't like it. What's the matter, Trigger? You going soft? Maybe I am. You know what happens to pals of mine that go soft. No. No, I don't. Nothing much. Nothing much that you'd care to hear about, and we don't even notify their families. I don't know. Does that make much difference to me? I can't even remember my family. You can't remember lots of things, but they happened, so what? So I want to quit. Trigger. I want to quit, do you hear? I don't know what I did before or how I felt before, but 
I know I couldn't go around knocking off guys just because you put the finger on them. Not now. Maybe the sock on the head softened me or made me yellow or reformed me or whatever else you want to call it, but I just couldn't kill a guy and I know it. Not now. There's something inside tells me. What are you going to do about it, Trigger? There's nothing to prevent me from walking out of here. Why, you did it. Take it easy, Al. Well, look, Trigger. How many guys have you knocked off? I don't know. I can't remember. I can't remember anything except what you told me. Now listen to me. And listen carefully. I know of six. Me? Six murders? Yeah. And I don't know how many before you started working for Al. I heard you'd done plenty. Sure. Sure, you can walk out of here if you want to, but it won't do you no good. I don't get it. Six murders. Practically every cop in the country's got orders to drag you in, dead or alive. And with your rap as a cop killer, they're going to shoot first. Now, you want to walk or do you want to play ball? Well, I'll stay. I have to stay. Katie, will you stop jumping from one chair to another? I can't help it, Trigger. Makes me nervous to stay in one place. Well, then get out of here. I can't. I would do sick like that. You're not doing me any good. Why don't you get out? I'd... Oh, hi, Chief. Well, Trigger, I see you've quieted down. Not so independent like you were a couple of hours ago. Well, I'm okay now, I suppose. Petey, you can take a few minutes off. I'll stay with, uh, with Trigger. Thanks, Chief. Now, are you going to work for me, or do you want to be plugged by a cop? I said I was staying. Make sure you mean it. I've got a little job for you. Oh? Who is it? There's a little squirt of a reporter on the Daily Herald in this town, and he's out to cause trouble. What's he done? Shut his mouth off about me. Every day for the last week in his paper, he knows too much. What's his name? Jim Briggs. Where can I... Where can I contact him? I don't know where he lives or what he looks like. Kogan, my outside man, is trying to get some dope on him before you go to work. All right. Okay. See you later. Pete. Yeah, Chief. Fred, Schmidt, and me are going out on some business. You stay and keep Trigger company. Sure, Chief. So long. So long. Pete, how long have I been working for Al? Three years, about. Why? It's funny me not remembering. Who'd I work for before? I don't know. You never told me. Do I have any friends, you know, outside the mine? I don't know. You didn't talk much. How about family? I guess you got some. Where do they live? I don't know. Did you ever see me with a girl or, or anything? Why are you me? asking all these questions? Come on, Petey, tell me. I don't know nothing, I tell you. I don't understand, Petey. Can't you tell me anything about myself? Will you quit pestering me? Petey, did I ever serve time? Yeah, yeah, what, I think you did. What prison? Stop it, stop it, will you? Don't ask me no more questions. I only asked you what... I can't stand it, I can't stand it. I just shut up. Questions, questions, questions. I gotta get out of here. I gotta get out of here. Petey. What's the matter with that guy? Yeah, come in. Excuse me, sir. Uh, you mind if I do a bit of dusting? No, not at all. Come on in. Yeah, Mr. Drake told me not to disturb you. But the dirty room kind of gets you down when you have to stay in it, don't it? Yeah, it does. Ooh. That's a nasty knock you've got on your head. It's nothing. I just bumped into a door. Oh? Well, if you'd like, I'll send Dr. Reisner up. He's the hotel doctor. Very good he is. No, it'll get better by itself. Well, just as you say, sir. Well, I'll be on my way now. Just a look in a promise, but I'll do a fair job tomorrow. Thanks. Oh, just pick up that piece of paper near the door, will you? This one? Yeah. You want it? Yes, please. Petey dropped it. I'll give it to him. Thanks. Yes, sir. Here. Yeah? Goodbye. So long. Petey, tell Al everything's set for Trigger's burial. You supply a body, Kogan. So they're going to get rid of me. Well, we'll see about that. Trigger! Hey, Trigger! Huh? Did you happen to see me drop a little piece of paper? Piece of paper? Yeah, when I went outside. No, Petey. No. No, I didn't.
Our story is about a mine, a mine from which all memory has been erased. Its owner was brought to the headquarters of Al Drake's notorious gang in the Crescent Hotel. There, his history was taught him by Fred Booth, brains of the gang. There he was told that he was Trigger Martin, Trigger Martin who had killed many men. Even though he felt he could not go on with his murderous career, he knew he was bound to it by his past. But then he intercepted a message that indicated he was to be killed. Everything set for Trigger's burial. You supply body. Why do they want to kill me? The cops I can understand, but me, their own pal. I've got to get out of here. I've got to escape. I've got to... Trigger. What do you want? Snap out of it. I wasn't doing anything, Schmidt. You're sitting there thinking I don't like it. Well, what do you want me to do? Talk. Talk? I don't feel like talking. Petey says you drove them nuts with your talking. Now you're quiet like a boneyard. Come on, talk. All right, I'll talk. Do I have any family, Schmidt? I didn't say for you to ask questions. That's all I've got on my mind. Well, keep me yourself, then. You don't like staying here with me, do you? Well, Tommy, though. You said you shouldn't be left alone. I'll be all right. I won't try to get away. I didn't ask you that. Oh, go ahead, Schmidt. I'll be okay. I'll play some of the records. I don't want to get into no trouble with that. You won't. Go on. Go on. Take a little time off. Thanks. Thanks, Trigger. I'll see you. Uh, pick a good loud record. Stardust, St. Louis Blue. Darktown, Stiller's Ball. Look at this. Personal Recording Studios, Boardwalk, Atlantic City. Regards to Al and all the gang from Gloria and Trigger. This I gotta hear. Gloria. We're having a great time here, and we just thought we'd send you like regards from the boardwalk. Come on, Trigger, say something. It won't hurt you, dope. Say hello. Say anything. Well, I just want to send our regards, Al. I mean, me and Gloria. How long do I have to talk, Gloria? Well, I just want to send our regards, Al. I mean, me and Gloria. How long do I have to talk, Gloria? Say hello. Say anything. Well, I just want to send our regards, Al. I mean, me and Gloria. How long do I have to talk, Gloria? I'm not Trigger, then. I'm not. But who am I? Do they know who I am? Why are they trying to tell me I'm Trigger Martin? He's asleep now, Chief. Petey's standing outside the door. Fred. Yeah? I don't like it. Why not? It's too smart, it won't work. Oh, what's worrying you? Someone's gonna miss him. That means trouble. Maybe he don't know anybody in town. That chance. Get him out of here tomorrow. Kill him. Not me. I don't like murder. Look, Chief. The guy is sold completely on the idea that he's Trigger. Gives me the willies here. Trigger waiting to be buried, and this guy thinking he's him. Oh, stop acting like Petey. Look, the guy gets in our way when we're doing a job. Schmidt knocks him out with his clumsy mitts. We can't leave him around. None of us wants to bump him off unless we have to. Then I come to the rescue. We should have left him there. If I'd known he'd lost his memory then, I would have. But this way, he's going to bump off Briggs, and we'll be in the clear. It's a perfect setup. You hope. Sure it is. I'll figure it out for yourself. I don't know, Fred. I only wish I knew who he was. <laughs> Mm-hmm. How you feeling? Oh, much better today, Fred. Your head all right? Oh, sure. Al told me he had a job for me. Yeah. I think I could do it today. You better do it today. That's what I came to talk to you about. Al said the guy's name is Jim Briggs. That's right. And if you know what's good for you, Trigger, you're going to get him. But fast. Look what he says in today's paper. The most flagrant flatter of the law in this gang of hoodlums is a vicious gunman who goes by the name of Trigger Martin. Of all the members of this organized crime syndicate, he should be the easiest to convict, for it is rumored that he is responsible for at least six cold-blooded murders. How about some action, Mr. Police Commissioner? What do you think about that, Trigger? Let me see that. What do you want to say it for? I read you the part about you. I want to see it. 
Okay, here, punish yourself. The most flagrant flouter of the law in this gang of hoodlums is a vicious gunman by the name of Trigger Martin. And how do you like that? That guy's going to see that you burn unless he gets shut up. Hey, what's eating you? Fred, did I ever see this article before? No, you couldn't have. Just come out today. For a second, I thought... You got no time to think, Trigger. The only thing that'll do you any good now is to get a hold of that Briggs and... Yeah, yeah. You're right, Fred. Briggs. He's my man. <laughs> Listen, Al, I've been waiting three hours. I can't stand it. i got to get into action. Take it easy, Trigger. Let me track the guy down. That's Petey's job. Yeah, as soon as he's got the dope, I'll give the go sign. But, Al, I'm a dead duck if I don't nail Briggs and soon. Yeah, you will be. But we can't afford to make any mistakes. That's what I've been telling him, Chief. But he got all worked up about those newspaper articles. Save it, Trigger, until... Well, that must be Petey. Open up, Schmidt. Okay, Fred. Well, Petey. Any luck? I just get a line on this guy, Briggs. Go ahead. And don't rush me, Chief. Makes me nervous. Come on. The Herald got him in from Chicago to do this job on us. He's new to town. That's why we don't know him. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Where does he live? He's got his office set up and his room's in the same place. Sends his stuff to the Herald over the phone. Petey, where does he live? Gee, Chief, didn't I tell you? 41 McDougal Alley in the basement. One of them garden apartments. Did you get that, Trigger? Sure. 41 McDougal Alley in the basement. Okay, that's right. And here's your gun. Get going. Yeah. McDougal Alley. 47. 45. 43. Ah, uh, 41. Careful. Maybe a trap. Don't forget they've been lying all along. Careful. Careful. It's the door. Door to his apartment. Maybe he'll help me if he doesn't shoot me first. I'll try the door. It's not locked. It's dark. I'll let a match. Jump up, Regan. Okay, let, Crider. I, 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 let me go. No, you don't. Hold let, me, Crider. Let, let go of me. Watch him, Regan. He's got a gun. I see. Good. Oh. Yeah, good work. Right on the head. He's out. Well, that'll take care of him for a while. Yeah, it was a close call. Those as I've had since I joined the force. Yeah, that gun ain't no toy. Mm. He's coming around. Let us snap the cuffs on him. All right. Wonder what his angle is on the case. I'll question him. Hey, come on. Come on, snap out of it. Wake up, uh, you. My head. Come on, come on, come on out of it. What? Hey, who are you? What are you doing here? That's just what we were going to ask you. What? This is my apartment. My name is Briggs, Jim Briggs. Jim Briggs disappeared three days ago. We're working on the case. If you're Jim Briggs, maybe you can tell us where you've been. Half the police force has been looking for Briggs. I, I don't know. I, I can't remember. All I know is that I'm Jim Briggs and this is my apartment. Yeah? Do you usually come into your apartment with a gun in your hand? I, I don't know. All I remember is... I, I remember watching a gun battle. You sure you weren't in it? And then... Yeah, I remember now. A little. I, I was in a hotel somewhere in town with... some men named Drake... and Booth and Schmidt and, and Petey. Hey, Kreider. That's Al Drake's mom. Yeah. And this guy is one of them. He must be that Trigger Martin character. You know, we never got pictures of any of them. No, I'm Jim Briggs, I tell you. Look, give me a chance. I think I can lead you to their hideout. Please... I think I remember where it is. (laughs) 
Okay, Fred, this was your idea. He'll come back, Al. I got that guy completely bamboozled. Now, listen, Chief. I don't want to stay here and be trapped. They'll get us. They'll get us for sure. Pity, shut up. What I tell you, he's back. Okay, open up, Schmidt. Well, Trigger, did you do it? You told me to kill him, didn't you? Stop the dramatics. Of course I told you. Well, I did it. I found the guy in his apartment. I was working at a desk. He looked up and I gave it to him. Let's have your gun, Trigger. My gun? What for? Come on, hand it over. I, I threw it away. I don't believe you. Schmidt, grab him. Okay. No, you don't, Schmidt. Put up your hands. All of you. Now, Trigger. No point in getting jumpy. How long do you think you'll get away with Cut this? Cut it. You know I'm not Trigger and I know. Whoever you are and whatever your game is, no one person doesn't stand a chance against four. You won't get out of here alive. I think I will. Petey, open that door. Yeah, Quick. yeah, right away. Come on in, Crider. All right, you guys. One of these hoodlums into the wagon. Did you get what you wanted, Crider? Perfect. Direct evidence tying Drake to an attempted murder. We've been trying to get that for years. Great work, Mr. Briggs. Briggs, booze, you idiot. We had the guy all the time. Sure you had me. I didn't know it, and you didn't know it. Hey, that'll make a swell feature story. The case of the unidentified body written by the corpse itself. <laughs> shadows and stillness, mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hour. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio